This is the Hagman and Hagman Report for today. It is Sunday, January 13, 2013. I'm Doug Hagman. With me is my co-host, my son, Joe Hagman. Folks, you're about to hear three hours of an incredible, special Sunday night program. Uh, we, what we've got tonight is, is unprecedented. Uh, I shouldn't say unprecedented because uh, uh, both uh, Mr. Horn and Mr. Quill have been on uh, together, but uh, uh, unprecedented in our radio history. Folks, we have a special program tonight. Uh, uh, before I make the introductions, I just want to say, uh, Joe, welcome to the program tonight. Glad to be here. Uh, very excited for tonight's show. So let's just get right to it. All right. Uh, we have with us, and folks, uh, this is a pleasure, internationally renowned speaker, author, uh, lecturer, radio host, best-selling author of several books, including his one of his newest, Petrus Romanus, The Final Pope is Here, also Forbidden Gates, and Napoleon Rising, 2012. Folks, I've got those books. I've read those books. And they're fantastic. Tom Horn is a very well-known columnist whose articles have been referred to by writers of the LA Times, Syndicate, MSNBC, Christianity Today, New, New Man Magazine, World at Daily, Newsmax, White House Correspondents, and of course, that Northeast Intelligence Network, HomelandSecurityUS.com, and CanadaFreePress.com. Mr. Horn has been interviewed by people like U.S. congressmen, senators, and, and so on on his findings as well as he's been featured repeatedly in, in major media including top 10 talk shows including America's, Mor America's Morning News for the Washington Times, The 700 Club, The Harvest Show, Coast to Coast AM, Prophecy in the News, and the Southwest Radio Church, just to name a few. Mr. Horn has received the highest of honorary degree of doctorates bestowed in, 19, er, in 2007 from legendary professor uh, Dr. I.D. Uh, Thomas for his research into ancient history. And he's been endorsed by such national leaders as Dr. James Kennedy. Also with us, folks, is uh, Mr. Steve Quayle, renowned, internationally renowned best-selling author of numerous books, each of which I would recommend uh, everyone get. And, of course, uh, uh, he's the uh, the head of stevequayle.com. That's stevequayle.com. And, of, co of course, Mr. Horn can be found via homelandsecurityus.com. His home base, his home base is RaidersNewsUpdate.com. With that, Joe, do we have each gentleman on with us? Yes, we do. Hi, Steve. Good evening, Doug. Uh, good evening, Joe and Tom. What a delight. We get to go where uh, even some of the Star Trek uh, writers didn't go before or go be uh, yet before us. So tonight is going to be amazing. Uh, let's just say this, trip through Revelation Lane. And Tom, God bless you and thank you for the work you're doing. And I think it's important to start out, Doug and Joe, with Tom. And because the bottom line is, Tom and Chris Putnam have been in contact with some of the leading Vatican uh, astronomers, thinkers, theologians, and I think it's good to let Tom set the uh, uh, baseline for tonight's discussion because we're going to be talking about the aliens that are coming to be the saviors of mankind and humanity, and Tom and I have both written parallel concerning that for the past 15, 20 years. So independent of each other, God has knitted a framework and a tapestry of ever-increasing revelation. And by the grace of God tonight, I pray that people see the big picture. Tom, go ahead and take it and uh, share what it is that is coming upon you, excuse me, the earth. Hey, uh, Steve, great to be on with you again. And also, Doug and Joe, thank you for having me on the Hagman and Hagman Show with Steve Quayle. My first time to be on your show, uh, and I'm very excited about it, and I'm humbled to be on. Well, we're humbled to have you. And just to let you know, uh, Mr. Horn, at the top of the hour, we have about a three-and-a-half, four-minute break, uh, uh, and but, but the floor is yours until then. And by the way, we, we are being heard right now in about uh, just over, well, about 40 countries as we speak. So th this is a fantastic uh, platform for you. So you just go ahead and take it away. All right. Well, uh, Steve, Doug, Joe, um, as probably at least the three of you know. And by the way, Steve, I blame you for all this. This is your fault, you know. <laughs> well, I will take the blame because uh, obviously uh, I was starting this whole thing off and with the aliens and fallen angels, sexual corruption of the human race, I think that most people thought I was probably from another planet, but now they're coming to find out through your efforts that exactly what we're talking about is the biggest news behind the scenes. Is it not, Tom? 
Well, yeah, and, and what we found out, the reason I say we blame you is because, you know, a year ago we did a show with you uh, when we released the book Petrus Romanus. We were talking about the prophecy of the popes. And when we did that show, it became the number one uh, blog talk radio show in the world for one week. But then about four weeks later, you had me come back on, and we talked about the Vatican ET connection, which was really kind of just like an add-on conversation, right? And yet that show became the number one blog talk radio show in the world for over a month and stayed in the top ten for several months. And what it did was it illustrated to Chris Putnam and I that the world is very interested and, and maybe even can identify more with the, the idea of the Vatican's interest in extraterrestrial intelligence and even the idea of an alien savior, maybe they identify with that more than what was more a complicated conversation around the prophecy of the popes. And so your fault that we found out that the world was interested in that, but we couldn't have known where it was going to take us. And the very first thing that we decided we needed to do was to try to arrange, and we did, through the... Arizona State University, um, an opportunity to be able to go to Mount Graham because you can't go there unless you're invited to go there, and uh, and you, in fact you can't get up on the top of the mountain unless you go there with uh, a guard who has a key to the gate and they get you up there. And anyway, if people want to read about that, they can read about this new Exo Vaticana series. Uh, it's being published right now by Paul over at News with Views. Dot com. In fact, he has a, a new part to the series that's over there tonight. I'd encourage people to go over there and read. Uh, they'll also be able to find out more about the ongoing investigation in the weeks to come at RaidersNewsUpdate.com. And I promise all will be revealed uh, as we go along. We're actually doing something a little different this time, Steve, in that last time our investigation was finished when we did the radio show. This is almost kind of like right in the middle uh, we're still waiting on documents. So we've got documents that we're supposed to receive the first week of next month uh, that's going to verify some of the material that we're looking at right now. But anyway, the bottom line is the Exo Vaticana, there'll be a new part up again on Tuesday, and that will just keep uh, happening. Uh, we've been invited all over the world, uh, including, by surprise, Italian media, wanted us to come over to uh, Italy and talk to them about both uh, Exo Vaticana and Petrus Romanus, which we declined for security reasons. You know what I mean, Steve? Oh, I, I, that um, was a very wise decision. Uh, yeah. That's kind of like that's like kind of like Tom being uh, invited into the stew pot by a cannibal who promises a tasty meal. Unfortunately, it's you. Yeah, and we decided that we were probably not Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, so we, <laughs> we decided to pass on the invitation. But anyway, we went to Mount Graham, southeastern Arizona, to start the in, uh, investigation, and primarily why we went there. We learned a lot more than what we went there to learn, which was really a, kind of an exciting uh, surprise. But we went there in particular to ask about the projects and the observers that are approved to operate VAT, the Vatican Astronomical Technology Telescope. Uh, and um, we got the Jesuit father who was on duty that day on film, and that material will be talked about a little bit later, but we'll hint at a lot of it uh, tonight. But basically what we learned was the most important research occurring on top of Mount Graham, including the Vatican's astronomers, is the quest not just to pinpoint extrasolar planets, but certain extrasolar planets and advanced alien intelligence. Um, now, first, I should start by um, explaining, because there's a couple of things that seems like the public is a little bit confused about. So let me explain. First of all, on Mount Graham, you have the Mount Graham International Observatory Community. This consists of three telescopes. Uh, number one is the Large Binocular Telescope. That's an optical telescope, the LBT. It's one of the most advanced systems in the world, and people from all over the world compete for time and opportunity to be able to use that telescope. Uh, in between it and that uh, is the submillimeter telescope, which is a radio telescope that observes in the submillimeter wavelength range. And then last but not least, the reason we went to Mount Graham is the Vatican Advanced Technology Telescope, or VAT. Now, because there's been some confusion, there's something that I need to make clear for listeners. First of all, the Lucifer device is a device 
that is inside the large binocular telescope. It's mounted between the focal points of the LBT's two giant, uh, almost 30-foot uh, diameter telescope mirrors. Um, the Lucifer instrument observes in the near-infrared wavelength range, which is important for reasons we can discuss in a, mo in a moment. Um, it, it detects objects that are too far away or faint to be observed by regular telescopes or also to be even observed in visible light, what our eyes would see, like distant planets and so on. Uh, it has longer wavelengths than visible light. It means it can pass through astronomical gas, dust, without being scattered, and that sort of thing. So in other words, objects that are obscured from view in the visible spectrum can be viewed by using the Lucifer's infrared technology in the LBT. For example, you know how um, UFO researchers have fascinated for a long time how infrared technology can be used to spot and track unidentified flying objects in the heavens, right? Stuff that can't be seen with other telescopes or the naked eye. In fact, if people want to Google or YouTube, some of the most astonishing uh, UFOs that have ever been caught on film and tracked were caught with infrared technology. But um, on the connection between the Vatican astronomers and the Lucifer device, this is where stuff kind of gets interesting. And there are several points I'd like to make just real quick if I can. First of all, there's a curious description on the Vatican Observatory website concerning the Lucifer device. And it's under this heading on their website. It says, quote, NASA and the Vatican's infrared telescope called Lucifer, a German-built NASA and the Vatican-owned and funded infrared telescope for looking at Nabiru menaces, end quote. And why the uh, Vatican Observatory website has allowed that, com that caption to remain on their site is curious because, uh, as you know, Nibiru and Nemesis, these are planets that return in orbit close to the Earth after very long periods of time. These might be something that can't be seen in the visible spectrum, but perhaps can be seen in infrared. Um, these are planetoids that have been connected in modern myth with planet X and so on, but more darkly with the destruction of planets that some believe occurred during a great war between God and Lucifer when the powerful angel was cast out of heaven in the book of Job, where the prophet details how God uh, destroyed the literal dwelling places of the angels that made insurrection against him. Job uh, 26, people can read about that. It specifically mentions there uh, the destruction of Rahab, which is a planetary body that was also known as pride in ancient times. And in Job it says, from which God drove the fugitive snake. So the question is, and this is part of our investigation, and this is a big question, is Rome and other world powers using the Lucifer device to observe something that the rest of us are unaware of, something that they believe represents this ancient war, or maybe something else, keeping an eye uh, on approaching what, angelic? transportation devices, UFOs, something that, remember Father Malachi Martin hinting at that? Um, and then there's another point that I should make here very quickly, and I'm, I'm trying not to hog the time here, but these are really important points based on the... No, no, hey, Tom, take, yeah, take the time because, again, this is critical that you lay this out because uh, this is just preparatory, so don't be worried about passing the mic to me because I'll chime in in the second or third hour, but lay out everything you need to lay out because what okay. people have got to understand real quick is that there is an expectation that the alien saviors are coming. They've openly talked about it, and they've openly planned to get everybody ready to accept uh, the, the uh, intergalactic messiah. So just take it away, and don't be worried about turning the mic over to me. Well, hey, and, and, and Mr. Uh, Mr. Horn, uh, let me jump in here just for a second here. We, we've got a couple of uh, people just asking if you can uh, uh, adjust your mic, uh, perhaps maybe uh, uh, talk a little bit louder or put it closer to your to your to your mouth. I'm not sure if you've got a volume control there or not. Yeah. Oh, is that better? We don't, it, it, yeah, we don't want to miss a word. I, 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 it should okay. be. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll try to speak up. Um, 
um, there's another thing here that I should say that's very important at the outset. Um, the Jesuits at VAT, and we've gotten feedback from some of the Jesuits even since we launched the Vaticana series, even though the information we got was from the astronomers at VAT, and since that time with Guy Kalsmanago, who's one of the leading, the top leading Vatican astronomers who has done several uh, exchanges with us in interview, he too has said that the world is soon going to look to aliens for their salvation. So this is, it's not like this is a hidden secret, and we're not getting this information third hand and fourth hand. We're getting it right uh, from the astronomer's mouth. But the Jesuits at VAT, one thing that they've been saying publicly, and it needs to be kind of clarified, uh, is that they will deny any part in the naming of that infernal Lucifer instrument at the large binocular telescope next door. Now, we give them that, that they themselves didn't name it, but what they don't point out is how they have access to using it, plus they are an integral part of the whole complex at Mount Graham International Observatory, and as such, they are connected to the very consortium, the German astronomers, that did name Lucifer. And by the way, uh, this is not something I'm yet prepared to talk about. Chris Putnam's doing the investigation on this. But the German uh, consortium are also part of the odious Max Planck Institute. And if that rings a bell with you, Steve, it's because that's the group that gave assistance to the murderous experiments of Nazi scientist Dr. Mengele in the 1940s. But that's Absolutely. a different part. That's a different part, and, and uh, I'm not yet qualified to talk about that, but that is part of this in investigation. Now, in our interview with Vatican astronomer Guy Cosmonalgo, uh, he indicated that the Borg, that's the Vatican Observatory Research Group, uh, now have a new Jesuit point man in the search for alien planets that has access to the use of Lucifer. He told us, I'm just going to quote what he said, quote, as it happens, one of us, Father Paul Gabor, just finished his Ph.D. thesis work at the Paris Observatory on designing an instrument for a proposed European Space Agency spacecraft mission to search for exoplanets. But his work was in optics, not biology. So he has just moved to Tucson and is developing collaborations with those at the University of Arizona, end quote. So based on Cosmonago's statement to us, the Vorg have a well-placed insider in the Large Binocular Telescope uh, through their association with the University of Arizona and therefore also have an ongoing use of Lucifer. So um, sometimes people will talk in circles because I, I, if I was, a, you know, if I was uh, a Jesuit, I too wouldn't want the public connecting me to an instrument called Lucifer that's being used to look at something the rest of the world can't see. <clears throat> but it's a little disingenuous to say we're not part of it because we didn't name it when, in fact, you're part of the same consortium in the Mount Graham Observatory uh, community. So I just wanted to, to, to make that point uh, very quickly. Now, there's some, imp there's some other very important points before we g get out of this first part of this show. This is, uh, again, being inter uh, uh, investigated by uh, Chris Putnam, who so far has found uh, a great deal of a very important information, but the VAT facility, first of all, it was it really it was the brainchild of Jesuit George Coyne, who became the director of the Vatican Observatory in 1978. And in addition to his duties as a Jesuit, he was an adjunct professor in the University of Arizona's astronomy department. That's how he's connected with all these people. He was also associate director of the Stewart University there in Arizona. He is a darling of the atheist community. He has appeared with Richard Dawkins advocating a deistic form of Darwinism. He also promotes a radical form of pluralism, the idea that all religions lead to the same God. And you have to understand that this is part of the world view that is behind their current interest in astrobiology. It's important because um, in 1980, Koina is the one that brokered the agreement between the University of Arizona and the Vatican where Rome would pay a fee so that members of the Vatican Observatory Research Group could use the Stewart Observatory at the University of Arizona. So they have this um, symbiotic relationship with the university 
where um, the what can I call them, the seminal allies in forming the international consortium that oversees Mount Graham, uh, not only includes uh, Catholic institutions like Notre Dame University, uh, a very large group of Italian observatories, and also the Max Planck Institute of West Germany, uh, but this is this is this influential conglomerate is, and this is the part to just remember, consists of these partners: the Vatican the United States, Italy, and Germany. So when we were at the Large Binocular Telescope, I even asked uh, one of the instrument engineers that was explaining how Lucifer works to us <coughs> uh, if the Vatican, or if its astronomers, uh, could make use of Lucifer, or did they make use of Lucifer? And since he wasn't the one that organizes who uses it, he wasn't exactly sure, but he simply repeated the fact that uh, any of the astronomers there, if they make application to get time, uh, certainly could be using it, and, and since they're in that community, they do. So um, now, one other fast thing. I, I realize I'm kind of jumping around here, but there were some points that I wanted that, that are based on feedback we've been getting v, via email that I wanted to answer real fast. And finally, the question was that came in was, uh, why was the VAT uh, even organized? I mean, what what is the purpose, and why was Mount Graham chosen as the location? And um, so very quickly, um, that went into operation. At the time it went into operation, the the media was asking the same question, because you know there was a lot of Indians uh, in the community there. They were forming lawsuits, all kinds of things to try to stop the construction of these um, telescopes on top of Mount Graham, and the Vatican was using some of its own political influence, twisting arms to be able to get up on the mountain. And so the press was asking why the Vatican wanted to be up there, and what would that be dedicated to doing? What was its purpose? And Koina uh, made a very startling revelation uh, when he spoke with the uh, press, Bruce Johnston, of the London Daily Telegraph, a conservative newspaper uh, with a good reputation, interviewed him at the time. And here is what he reported uh, October 28, 1992, in an article titled Vatican Sets Evangelical Sites on Outer Space. Here's what Coinus said, quote, the Roman Catholic Church is to team up with America's space agency to look for life in outer space and so spread the gospel to extraterrestrials. Jesuit priests who run the Vatican Observatory near Rome say they are joining forces with the U.S. NASA agency to hunt for UFOs and signs of life on planets in solar systems similar to Earth's. NASA's job will be to monitor the alien communication signals. The Vatican, which has helped to build a new reflector telescope in Tucson, Arizona, will search for planets displaying the conditions for life, end quote. So uh, now we know what that was built for and what it was supposed to do. And ultimately, this raises some very serious questions that we can talk about tonight and that we are busy right now nailing down uh, the actual documentation for the book Exo Vaticana. Um, and there's some startling stuff that comes up here. Uh, is the Sky Island known as Mount Graham? As strange as the question might sound, is it the location of a, of a dimensional portal? Is it, it why they chose it? In other words, why Mount Graham? And when you look at what the Indians believe about that area, there's some there's some shocking stuff actually, Steve, that has to do with with um, uh, uh, ancient giants that were in that absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And, and Tom, just let me interrupt you real quick. Just so you know, we haven't talked except exchanged email links, but I am so focused on that area and the uh, Native American traditions and in the process, I won't say how I'm doing it, but interviewing uh, Native Americans, some of the eldest living Native Americans and what they have to say. By the way, that whole area, I'll say it, make it easy. That is one of the many stargates, and it's amazing to me how now the Native Americans and their 
obviously the Giants fit into this and the Giants come through the gate. And isn't it interesting that you said on one of the shows we did several years ago on a specific date there would be a giant scene and lo and behold they were seen in Uffington, England at the CERN, the, not, not the CERN that the uh, particle accelerated, but at the, where they, uh, the giant chalk figure. That very place is where the Giants, the, the multiple pl policemen saw it. And now, isn't it strange, we haven't talked and that's where my whole area of focus is personally is on the stargates of the desert southwest the legends myth and the extraterrestrial visitation to those specific tribes now that's amazing to me and then again yeah. ladies and gentlemen when when tom and i go on together we just are kind of blown away by how the lord is leading us separate and distinct but bringing it into focus so the parts that we each have uh, can form a complete picture so isn't that fascinating that i'd be involved with the muscolero apaches and others uh you know and their legends and now you're talking about mount graham and the significance of it and why it was chosen by the way you know at one point one of those routes in that area one of the highways was known as route 666 the devil's highway yeah, that was the highway that was actually changed. That's the highway that yes. you have to take in order to get to Mount Graham. Right. Isn't that you fascinating? Why would, why would it be called, you know, the Devil's Highway, Route 666? It was changed. Uh, Lucifer, I, and you said something, I think we've got, I just got to stop you on real quick. The whole technology being run through the Germans and, and the whole uh, tie there, and I know this is going to sound amazing to a lot of people, but it goes back to the Antarctic and New Schwabenland and the Nazi technological uh, joint venture with aliens. I'm not talking illegals here. And it's fascinating that you're in Arizona. Antarctica has come into the, the uh, focus of a lot of concern because of all the nations building telescopes there. So the tie is like a cerebral cortex and all the neurons and axions tying and coming together. And I think this is the time of Daniel that God spoke about to his servant Daniel that the gates are not only be opened, as you have been talking about in the Amman Gate and we talked about years ago, but now the knowledge that's increasing, unfortunately, all knowledge isn't good because with much knowledge comes much sorrow. So the fact that you are at one of the Stargate portals yeah, and one of the most renowned, I think, is just mind-blowing. And the connections of all what we would call esoteric, as psychic, and occultic powers are, pun intended, focusing their eyes in the infrared spectrum on who's coming. What is Lucifer? He's a light bringer. Right. And Continue, it's, sir. It, it, it's just only a coincidence, right, that they named that instrument Lucifer? Yeah. Um, you you mentioned you, that I said that tongue in cheek. By the way, you you mentioned uh, CERN, and you and I talked some years ago at uh, how at CERN their own top uh, physicists were saying that something might come through a dimensional door at the large uh, collider. Did you see the the news story this week uh, where they were talking about how 2012 was a big year in science, but 2013 is going to be even bigger? And when you read the article, we have it linked, I think, at Raiders News Update today. When you read the article, what they're talking about is how next month in February, CERN is going to be closed uh, down, going to be shut down for 24 months for a very specific reason, and that's so that they can supercharge it. Why? This, according to CERN, they're going to supercharge it because in 2015 they hope to be able to open portals and find out if there are other dimensions. And they, this, the language in the article says they want to know if there are other realities there and people inside these other dimensions, uh, extra or not necessarily extraterrestrial, but um, intelligence inside these other dimensions. So, and 2015, of course, is also very important. Let me say something about these mountains while it's still, uh, you know, part of our conversation. Mountains, first of all, universally are associated with deities and spirits. That's even true in the Bible. But history suggests that part of the reason that the native people there considered Mount Graham to be holy involved several things. One was unusual heavenly activity there in ancient times when UFOs that were called spirit lights moved through the sky around that mountain, something that even contributed to the local Indians, their, their attribution of powers to the solar system and natural phenomenon. Uh, the base of the mountain hosts the uh, St. Paul Paceus Orthodox Monastery, which is a, a women's community that's dedicated to intercession for the alleged Marian phenomenon. Now, you know, as evangelical Christians, we don't accept Marian dogma, 
Uh, I, our position, I think, at least for some of us, is that so-called Marian apparitions are really more akin to UFO phenomenon anyway. And that's a position that's supported even by some Catholic scholars, uh, including the pro-Catholic scientists at the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, Dr. Nelson Pacheco. I don't know if you wrote his out of print, uh, read his out-of-print book, Unmasking the Enemy. I can send it to you. But he warns the Vatican. He's a pro-Catholic. He's respected by them. And he warns the Vatican that many Marian apparitions are actually identical to deceptive UFO manifestations and that they need to be careful in the way they interpret them. Um, another thing regarding Mount Graham. The, uh, and I mentioned this a moment ago, the giants, the, the, uh, we learned uh, that the uh, San Carlos Apache, they have an ancient tale. Uh, maybe you already know about this, Steve, but probably most of the listeners wouldn't, concerning a race of giants that were known as the Giandupids, if I'm saying that correctly. Um, and they were judged and destroyed by the Great Father. Now, <clears throat> the, uh, the Phoenix metropolitan area, which is basically where I grew up, that covers Maricopa County and Penal Counties, but it's often referred to as the Valley of the Sun. Know why? Because according to the legend, there was a race of Indians called the Tartums, and they lived in the valley. They were peaceful farmers. They prospered, and then one day they were invaded by these Jindupids, which are described as Goliaths. They, they used uh, tree limbs for toothpicks. Um, and these Nephilim were led by a massive man named Evelkin uh, that allegedly came from the northeast and were headed south to their home beyond the Gulf of Baja. And these giants nearly wiped out the Tartums before they hid themselves underground uh, in the mountains. And that was when the father or the son, according to Indian legend, threw this huge fireball that seared the monstrous Nephilim into the scorched mountain rock. Now, elements, of course, of the Indian tale are obviously mythologized in the modern uh, version by the Indians, but the original story uh, has remarkable thematic coherence to Genesis chapter 6. Another thing we learned about this mountain is that it is central to the Apache creation myth, uh, and it tells of the one who lives above and who descended in a flying disc at the start of creation, right? And so in their creation myth, they talk about how nothing existed, no earth, no sky, only darkness everywhere. Um, but then suddenly from the darkness emerged this disk. And on one side of it, it was yellow. The other side was white. It's suspended in midair. And within the disk sat a bearded man, the creator, the one who lives above. And so all of that mountain range is associated with supernatural gateways and openings and UFO uh, phenomenon. And these and the gateways that are there, I can't I can't even say the Indian name. It's C H I N A I T I H, Chinita or something like that. But it means a gateway. There's a gateway that is there, a portal, and spirit beings can come back and forth uh, through this portal. And the other things that there's just so much here that's interesting about this. Maybe I shouldn't get hung up on it, but no, no, this is critical. This is critical, Tom. This is not hung up. This is critical. Well, they, they, they talk about the owl, right? Now, yeah, to the Apache owl. Indian, the owl, you know, it, it, and, and dreaming of this owl would signify maybe approaching death or departure or abduction. The Hopis uh, called him uh, Koko, the watcher of the dark, uh, and the god of the dead, and the god of the underground, the god that would go down into this portal. All of, anyway, all of it's fascinating given when you look at what we call modern abduction phenomenon that also involves discs and flying geniuses. Oh, another part of the Indian uh, folklore was this dragon that appears that can talk like a man and make, tries to make deals with the Indian tribes in exchange for, guess what, they're women, right? Um, but how much all of this is connected with al the alien abduction accounts, even where the owl is a disguise, wherein the abductee is led to believe that the bug-eyed alien in their memory was actually an owl that they had seen somewhere and had it lodged in their memory. Uh, but owls have been associated in Christian history with sorcery, flying witches, uh, and, and, and anyway, so many legends that seem to mirror abduction phenomenon, the um, collecting of human 
uh, and animal genetic material, uh, dragons trying to make deals with mankind, portals, uh, you know, through which these supernatural creations can move. Well, anyway, this is, the more you study about Mount Graham, the more you find that supernatural gateways are tied to the mountain range, and they were a long time before the Vatican cast its eyes on Mount Graham, and yet their whole reason for building the Vatican Astronomical Technology Telescope seems to correspond to the legends that were upon that mountain. Well, and uh, let me throw something in, too, Doug, and I got your message. Uh, I actually am muting when I'm off the air, just so you know. Uh, I, I keep hearing a bunch of noise in the background, too. But uh, listen, the thing is is that it's critical that people understand this. What is the Bohemian Grove's uh, uh, patron uh, bird? It's the owl. In, the, in my book, Long Walkers, Tom, the sacrifice that took place to... Uh, ex uh, well, when John Paul, at what, 22nd passed away, there were two owls present at one of the most demonic rituals in the history of the world, observed by a multi-star general, who gave me the blow-by-blow, -blow, literally, account, and they actually summoned a live uh, giant that was, I, I guess, somewhere around 14, 16 feet, and fed it a live child in a sacrifice. Now, here's what's interesting, and again, ladies and gentlemen, Tom and I have not discussed this off-air, is the sh the... Navajo word for the giants was shaman, S-H-A-W-M-A-N. The fascinating thing about it is we get the word shaman, and the original shamans were all the giants. And guess what they bartered for to give the secret knowledge to the people that wanted? They were they asked for the children's life so they could eat them. Isn't that fascinating? This is coming from one of the oldest living Navajos in Navajo land. So the word shaman, in other words, like we would say Bigfoot, Yeti, uh, whatever, Shengdu, whatever they are called all over the world, but the point is the word shaman literally comes from shaman, which means the giants. And the giants ate the people, and, and you can't go to the desert southwest, Mr. Legends, without one factor. These people were, people, forgive me, these entities, the giants, were voracious in their appetite, and they literally just uh, cut a wide swath, and in order to get secret knowledge, sacrifice had to be made, their children had to be given, and the shaman, or actually now the shaman, were more than willing to do that. So I thought that was a fascinating uh, 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 bit of information. I was completely unaware of until it was made known to me. Well, the bottom line, Steve, it, 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 all of our experiences on Mount Graham and since Mount Graham, and by the way, we haven't just interviewed the Vatican's astronomers. We have a whole list of experts from around the world. In fact, when we release the book, uh, Exo Vaticana, we're going to offer more than 20 solid hours of audio recordings from interviews with experts all around the world, including people in government with high, te with high uh, uh, security clearance levels. It's just the most, uh, you know, it's the, it's the biggest thing that I've ever been part of. And I really thought that was true with Petrus Romanus, and we wouldn't have written this without Petrus Romanus. And by the way, Petrus Romanus is intricately involved in this whole issue because with the coming of an alien savior, he's going to have to have the person on earth that has the ear of the religious community celebrating his uh, arrival and pointing the world towards him, and that's going to be Petrus Romanus. Uh, in, my, in my belief, and, and what we're still waiting for Petrus Romanus to make his uh, presence known. We know that he is alive because according to a 900-year-old uh, prophecy, the prophecy of the popes that was kept inside the Vatican's vaults for hundreds of years, the very next pope following Pope Benedict the 16th will be the final one on that list and many experts interpret the prophecy as suggesting that this is going to be the false prophet of end times biblical fame and I think that with everything else we're seeing going on around the world, that that is very, very likely to be the case. And at any time, at any moment, um, that personality is going to appear. We can talk more about that later if we want to, but I don't want to get off the subject we're on right now because right now what our, what our uh, research is leading us to believe is that the social, spiritual, and academic intellectuals that are busy establishing Roman Catholic doctrine around either what they secretly know, and that's what I happen to believe, 
or at least what they suspect, if taken for face value, it appears to show that they believe, again, this is not speculation, this is after we talked to the astronomers, it, it, they believe that we are close to integration with intelligent alien life, and they also believe that this disclosure could ultimately reconfigure established doctrines of science, religion, salvation. They furthermore, uh, some of them believe that in a, the very near future, an alien influence is going to arrive on Earth, led by a man of unusual intelligence. Uh, and this person, if you just read what they are saying, is going to be the champion of a new gospel. Now, that's astonishing, right? That sounds incredible. And yet this is out of their own mouths. And in some cases, what they've written and published over the last couple of uh, years. So, but when you, now, when you think of that, and then you think of the scriptures, which foretold of another worldly leader's coming, an alien right, paganism's ultimate incarnation, the beast of Revelation 13. And the scriptures tell us a lot about him. First of all, it says he's going to arrive at the end of time, and that day is going to be accompanied, according to Luke 21, by, quote, fearful sights and great signs from heaven. And then Second Thessalonians tells us that that wicked one will be revealed, whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned, who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. That's Second Thessalonians uh, 2, 8 through 12. So the coming of the Antichrist is described, connected to lying wonders, and strong delusion from heaven. Um, and then finally, the prophet Daniel, I think, provides one of the greatest comments as to the identity of the coming of the false Savior when he says in the 11th chapter, uh, verse 39 of Daniel, that the Antichrist will be a worshiper of the God of forces, a God whom his fathers knew not. And that is a text that can literally be interpreted from the Hebrew to mean an alien God. So I, for one, believe now all of the intel that we have been gathering, and we have literally thousands and thousands and thousands of pages of intelligence documents now, so far, uh, plus what we're confirming right now, plus what the Jesuit on duty at that, the day we were there, told us and we filmed, plus what the Vatican astronomers afterward have told us, including interviews with Guy Cosmonalgo, points to uh, the astronomers on Mount Graham and those uh, also in Italy, and others at the Large Binocular Telescope. I know this is astonishing. I just have to say it. Uh, some people are just going to wave, you know, shake their head and think, how in the world can this guy believe this? But they're going to have to read the full report when it's available in April. It will be difficult for them to walk away from this statement. They are using Lucifer's infrared technology, I believe, to study either a series of planets that once or currently are under that powerful angel that was known as Lucifer, or they're watching something, like an armada of objects that are moving along a trajectory towards Earth that is somehow connected to Lucifer. And this goes back to what Catholic theologian Father Malachi Martin said before he died, or he was murdered in 1999, when he hinted at extraterrestrial disclosure and that it was soon forthcoming. And he did that more than once. Steve, you know the story. I know it. Uh, Doug and Joe, you probably know it. But for those people that are listening to this show, uh, this was in 1997. Uh, it was on Coast to Coast AM. Art Bell was interviewing Father Malachi Martin. And he asked Martin why the Vatican was heavily invested in the study of deep space at the Mount Graham Observatory that Chris Putnam and I just uh, visited in September. And uh, Malachi Martin, first of all, he was uniquely qualified. He was a ph phenomenal polyglot. He'd done all kinds of top-level research and work uh, for the Vatican, including interpreting the Dead Sea Scrolls. I mean, he was not a Johnny-come-lately. He was the personal secretary to uh, Augustine Bay, the top Jesuit. So he was, a, he was a, for that matter, he was a personal friend of the Pope's. Um, and when he was asked that question, by Art Bell, why is the Vatican on top of Mount Graham studying deep space? Here's what, Art, here's what Malachi Martin said. He said, because the mentality among those who are at the highest levels of Vatican administration and geopolitics know what's going on in space and what's approaching us. 
could be of great importance in coming years. So, and of course, you know, that was followed subsequent interviews uh, with Malachi talking about a, these, this mysterious something that was in the heaven that was approaching the earth from the north. Some people say he might have been an oblique reference to an end time portent, potent, which is a, a portent, which is a Catholic prophecy of the great comet. But people that are familiar with Malachi believe that he was referring to a near future arrival of alien intelligence. An interesting note, um, when we ask Father uh, Guy Cosmonalgo what he thought of Malachi's claims, uh, Cosmonalgo actually seemed to be upset by Malachi, he seemed to be miffed by him. And here's what he said to us, quote, I have heard stories about the late Malachi Martin, which make me rather suspicious of statements that come from him. I was at the observatory in the 1990s, and he never visited us, nor had anything to do with us, end quote. So that reaction, you know, seems really consistent with how a lot of other Catholic priests despised uh, Malachi's willingness to disclose what Rome wanted buried, especially the satanic cabal within the Jesuit order that Malachi Martin wrote about in all of his books. Well, that would definitely uh, not in, endear you to the uh, ruling power, the ruling elite, and I think it's, it's critical that people understand. Most people don't get whacked, assassinated, or murdered because they're far off the mark. It's because they're directly overhead. Now, Tom, I want to make this clear because we haven't been on for a number of years. Ladies and gentlemen, you can go look up the CERN, C-E-R-N-E, a boss giant. And basically, this is a 180-foot tall chalk figure, and it's uh, carrying a 120-foot club. Why is this critical, Tom, what we're talking about? When you and I went on, I've got to make this point. I feel it's so critical. When you and I went on talking about the last uh, multi-hour uh, shows we did, you made a statement that on a certain date we would see these giants. Now, isn't it interesting? I got a message from the people at the, uh, in, in Switzerland when they actually were or opening up the portals claiming they saw giant faces and it scared them. So what I'm saying is when you went on record saying by such and such a date, and I don't remember it, to the day was the day, and this is in Great Britain, when multiple policemen responded to reports in the area of the CERN a boss giant, A-B-B-A-S, it's C-E-R-N-E, a boss giant. Now you're talking about bringing it right fast forward. We are talking about a global uh, agreement amongst the most powerful people in the world to welcome Lucifer back to the planet. They're using all the technology of the fallen ones, all the technology of the ancient ones, and all that they're able to grasp, acquire, steal, murder for, or get in any way to make the fulfillment of the rule and reign of Lucifer on earth, pertinent and in a very timely way. And so we're there, and I would tell you this, all my sources say what's coming in from beyond the stars is an armada. It's not about Planet X, though that exists. It's not about Nibiru. It's not about Gabriel's fist. It's about this invasionary armada. And just so you know, and Tom, you had it too, I think on your website, but there was a, a, a tongue-in-cheek proposal for Death Star. You know, it was supposed mm -hmm. to cost a quadrillion dollars, blah, blah, blah. It would be interesting for people to know that we have, we, the United States, has a deep space-based assets watching exactly that. And there are Russians and American scientists, I think even Hoagland claims, uh, and rightfully so, that Phobos is artificial. So we've got all of everyone, everywhere, I'm just making a blanket statement now, who is aware of what's coming upon the earth, looking, and remember that famous prophecy in Obadiah, though you set your nest amongst the stars, yet will I bring you down. And I right. think what we're seeing right now is a whole lot of nests uh, no longer being feathered, but being dumped out. And I think that the woe unto the inhabitants of the earth is coming, and the, the Vatican knows it. Obviously, uh, the German interests, which are nothing more than, in many cases, if you will, the final Reich, the, the alien Nazi consortium, and it exists. So the point is, is that everything you're saying about Mount Graham and then the other Native Americans, different tribes, what you just are discussing for Mount Graham, uh, pretty much uh, de uh, defining it to in, in Arizona, the same myths, the same legends, and the same uh, expectations are throughout the entire Native American culture, whether you go to the Northeast, New England, the Algonquin, the Iroquois, everybody that's out in uh, 
uh, around the Great Lakes and further east, across the desert southwest, into Nevada. You can't get away from the giants, the alien connection, and the intel. And I think that was fascinating. When you just said that a minute ago, you and I caught a lot of flack for the last you know, a decade, two decades, whatever. But now everything we've talked about is pointing to that there is a great expectation. The only ones I see living in denial are people that simply don't want to embrace what you and I and others are laying out as is almost in irrefutable evidence that this is what they're going for. Well, sure, and I'm, I, I gave up trying to explain myself to anybody uh, a long time ago. I always know any book I write, anything I say, any show I do with you or anybody else, uh, it's going to send a certain community out there into a demonic frenzy once again, and some of them pretend to be Christians. Uh, and uh, But there's nothing you can do for them except uh, keep doing what we do, keep uh, uh, speaking the truth. And, of course, that itself is a sign of the end times. Uh, knowing that uh, Lucifer will come, or Satan will come down in great wrath, knowing that he hath but a short time. He's doing now the same thing he did. When Jesus came, the Pharisees, they would, they would try to set Jesus up, right? They would study his words to try to take something that he would say and take it out of context so they could trap him in uh, his words, and he was too smart for them. And you look around us right now. Every single show we do, every single thing we write, there's that community out there that tries to take anything we say or do, take it out of context, try to make it sound like we're, but whatever. Uh, Jesus said that the Pharisees were of their father, the devil. Uh, he said if they hate me, they're going to hate you too, so we'll just keep doing what we do. They'll keep doing what they do, and one of these days the judgment seat of Christ will happen and the sheep are separated from the goats. There is a mass uh, or something moving towards earth with a definite arrival destination. And I believe that it can only be seen using Lucifer-like infrared technology. This is where a great deal of our research is going to point. It's being monitored from Mount Graham. And by the way, Steve, it rings really true to what I was told from Phobos. Remember him? I, yes. don't, uh, I, I don't get to talk to him no more for reasons I can't explain. I haven't actually for a few years. But years before this infrared technology was brought to Mount Graham in the form of the Lucifer device, remember... And, and this, a couple of years before the Vatican uh, spokesperson started talking so much about uh, our space brothers, uh, he had said, when you see the Vatican start talking about this, know that the clock is ticking down. Remember, you and I did shows a decade ago talking about that. And almost yes. right after, uh, Cosmonalgo put out his little booklet talking about uh, our space brothers, uh, uh, Gabriel uh, Funes, went on uh, you know, into the media talking about our space brothers. But at the same time, um, uh, before infrared technology came to Mount Graham in the form of the Lucifer device, Phobos had told me uh, something that I then speculated about in the book The Aramon Gate. This was written in 2005, so it was years before Lucifer went to Mount Graham. Uh, and what he, had, what he had inferred was the governments of the world were secretly using infrared to monitor a hidden UFO armada parked uh, beyond view of our normal telescopes. And I wrote about that. You can read about it. It's like page 180 through 250 or whatever it is of the Aramon Gate, where I literally put into a fictional account, but exactly what uh, Phobos had told me. Well, now it turns out that the information that I received from him and used as an outline in the Aramon Gate might have been truer and way ahead of what I had understood at the time, uh, and uh, uh, and furthermore, that now seems to be set to start unfolding in the year 2013. Um, the bottom line is this, so I can get past this point. I'm looking at the clock. I realize we're going to go to break in just a moment. We intend to provide files, images, over 20 hours of audio interviews with leading experts, private PDFs sent to us from Vatican astronomers, even video that will more than suggest that Rome is paving the way for the imminent, widespread acceptance of an alien savior. And there's reasons why they are doing that that is beyond their control. They also believe it's going to lead the masses to believe that God's going to use these extraterrestrials in a way that he used them once before. Uh, in other words, they're interpreting them like we would think of as angels, as his agents in creation. 
And according to the Vatican's top theologians, this is going to be presented in a way that it does not immediately require us to explicitly renounce our faith in God, but it is going to require radical reinterpretation of Christianity as somehow this information uh, is presented. It's also going to be useful for establishing a global system and religion, another goal the Vatican has emphasized lately, uh, or as one of our consultants uh, wrote, the ripple effect is going to eliminate, I'm quoting now, any discernible obstacle to articulating a global religion that honors the cosmologies of all faiths, united as they are under the reality of an extraterrestrial influence, end quote. Wow. Uh, it, I feel like the uh, little little kid in the back of the classroom kind of diminutive uh, raising my hand, um, uh, Mr. Horn. Just to be clear here, we are facing what I, I guess the only way I describe it would be a massive deception that that that's being planned. Um, is 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 that a fair statement? I guess. In, in other words. What, what, we're, what, what, the, what the people of the world are about to see, about the witness, is a false coming, perhaps, or a false second coming, um, it, or is that is that too simplistic of, a, of an explanation? Well, no, um, that's that's absolutely what we're talking about. It will be part right. of I, I, a. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Tom. I didn't, I didn't mean to talk over you. It's part of the great deception. The word antichrist means in place of. It doesn't mean against. So the bottom line is what the Vatican is doing is shoehorning the idea that, number one, the aliens can be redeemed, and number two, they're going to spring at the right moment the fact that God is an alien power, that Jesus was a, a, a either a hologram or a... A, a genetically altered super uh, alien that came to save us, and and that's the ultimate deception, Jug. It's not a false rapture or anything. It is basically the total deception. Jesus made it easy when he said this: "I came and you received me not. Another will come claiming to be me. Him you will receive." So it's going to be in place of, not uh, out of place. In other words, they're going to substitute the alien god for the real God, and people are going to be deceived by it. Is that accurate, Tom? That's accurate, and furthermore, you can, if people want to Google this stuff, just type in Funus' name, type in our space brother, read what the Vatican is openly saying through its mouthpieces right now, in which they're saying that not only do aliens exist, but they might be closer to God than we are, morally superior to us, and they will be coming here to evangelize us, to show us a better way. That's the reason why the Vatican's top theologians are saying that we won't immediately have to renounce our faith in God, but once we understand the gospel as they do, since they're closer to God than we are, we fell, they didn't, they're morally superior to us, they're going to show us a better way, a clearer way, and they're going to be led by some type of a leader uh, who will, uh, I guess, be held up as the um, savior per, uh, persona. There's a there's a doctrine we won't go into, but it's called many Christ, and this is very this is very popular to the Vatican's astrobiologists right now. The idea that there that Christ might have been manifested in many ways on many different worlds to all kinds of intelligent beings, but those who haven't fallen have remained fully in His grace. They're not fallen like we are; uh, they're unfallen. They're superior to us morally and spiritually, and they're the evangelists that are coming to the earth to show us poor, dumb, stupid, lost earthlings uh, a better way to get to God, and they'll be doing that through their champion. That's exactly what they are saying, and it isn't just the documents we've received or the interviews that we've done. You can Google this and read this stuff for yourself. It's exactly what they're saying. So Mr. it is Horn. a great deception, and it is imminent. Yeah, you're exactly right. You can just look today at Fox News. Tom Cruise, uh, there's a headline, Tom Cruise thinks he's on a planet to fight aliens, according to his book, where he says that the aliens are going to come to protect humanity uh, from those who are bent on destroying this planet. I mean, that's just from a headline from today. Okay. You, you know, before we get started, I just want to say this. On my I've got on my left, on the left side, I've got uh, Steve Quayle's book, uh, Giants. And on my right, I've got uh, uh, two of Tom Horn's book uh, books, including Petrus Romanus and Napoleon Rising. And 
it, you know what, gentlemen, it's amazing how uh, seamless these books are. Uh, it's almost like you folks collaborated, uh, Steve and, and Tom, be, uh, you know, with Giants, and it, it's just amazing as, as you talk about this. I actually got chills uh, when you were talking about the Giants and, and uh, um, the uh, uh, the Mount uh, uh, Mount Graham, and I, it's just amazing. So, folks, I, you look. I, I, uh, we're not we're not in the business of of hawking books, uh, but, but I would say this: you'd be doing yourself a favor for your library for your information to, to grab uh, Mr. Horn's works as, as well as uh, uh, Steve Quayle's works because uh, what a what a great uh, amount of information you'll learn. But uh, glad to be glad to have you both back with us. I don't want to take any more of your time. So, Mr. Horn, the floor is yours. Well, <clears throat> I was only going to say, um, as I felt like we were transitioning there at the top of the hour, that I'd, I think it's going to be difficult um, for anybody to survey our final report in April. And by the way, it will be in a book called Exo Vaticana. And the reason is quite simple, because you, you can't go over five or 600 pages of information and do it as coherently when you're on uh, the radio, or at least I can't. I'm not that articulate. I have to sit down. I write different, and I think different when I'm writing, uh, and I'm doing that type of research. But it's that we're hoping to have it done in April, and I'm telling you that I, I guarantee you that nobody will read that and further doubt that someone or something is operating right now outside the average man's purview in at le and in league with at least some of the world's elite and smack dab in the middle of that conspiracy is not only NASA and, and other aeronautic and space administrations like the European Space Agency, but the Vatican. And in some ways, that makes perfect sense, really. I mean, official disclosure of extraterrestrial intelligence and habitable alien worlds, which, by the way, is likely to be announced in th this year, in 2013, according to scientists like Abel Mendez, who runs the Planetary Habitability Laboratory at the University of Puerto Rico, who wrote an article just last week saying it's going to be announced in 2013, and he said it's going to have a profound effect on humanity. So huh. this isn't just Tom Horn. This is experts in this field that are now admitting this. And it is going to have a profound effect on humanity. That's going to be true psychologically and spiritually. And due to the nature of man, why is the Vatican involved? Because most of the world's peoples are going to be looking for traditional religious leaders to put the revelation of exo-worlds and aliens into context. Well, as the most powerful church on earth, with its own diplomatic corps of ambassadors posted throughout the industrialized nations of the world, the Vatican is not only uniquely positioned, but as we intend to show, they've been actively preparing for this moment. Uh, in fact, um, you could go back even a decade. According to Monsignor Corraldo Balducci, who during his life he was an exorcist for the Vatican, he was a theologian for the Vatican, he was a member of the Vatican Curia, that's the governing body at Rome, uh, but he was also the official mouthpiece of the church concerning the reality not the speculation, the reality of aliens, and not the reality, uh, reality of aliens someday discovered, but the reality of aliens on Earth now. And the Vatican, he said, <clears throat> was closely following the alien presence on Earth now, and this is according to their own spokesman, using its embassies around the world to quietly compile material evidence on the extraterrestrials and their and their mission. And the Vatican, now he, he died a few years ago, but the Vatican has never refuted that revelation from Balducci. And in fact, in further evidence of the covert research, in 1976, Steve, do you remember the, the uh, there was a high-profiled attorney by the name of Daniel Sheehan? Remember him? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Harvard government law, uh, degrees in government law. He, he was the legal counsel on a lot of famous cases, the Karen Silkwood case, the Iron Contra affair, uh, Three Mile Island, Watergate. So this guy was really, you know, high profile. In fact, um, he got funds from Lawrence Rockefeller. He was the attorney that represented Dr. John Mack when Mack was about to lose his position 
in the university, his tenure, because he was uh, talking about people who were being abducted by aliens, and it was uh, it was Sheehan that represented him and kept him from losing his position over there. But Sheehan was the one he he tried to crack open the secret UFO files that are being held in the vaults of the Vatican Library. Now, if anybody should have been able uh, to get access to those files, it would have been Sheehan, because in addition to his uh, impressive legal profession, he was the general counsel to the United States Jesuit headquarters in Washington, D.C. And furthermore, he made a request to the Vatican for the Vatican's secret files, and when he did, he made the request at the behest of the United States government and at the behest of the President of the United States at that time, President Jimmy Carter, 1977. And Carter had asked to have the information regarding the existence of extraterrestrial intelligence and the UFO phenomenon that was being kept uh, in the vaults of the Vatican uh, made, um, made known to the President, not to the public, but just to the President. Um, and so agents of the government asked Sheehan, as the general counsel to the United States Jesuit headquarters there at the National Office in Washington, D.C., whether or not he could get access to, to that section of the Vatican Library in Rome that contained the information on extraterrestrial intelligence and the UFO phenomenon. So Sheehan, he goes to Father Bill Davis, who was the director of the National Office of the Jesuits in D.C. at that time, if he could follow that process, make it an official uh, an official request through the Jesuit headquarters, uh, and he got um, permission from uh, Bill Davis, uh, uh, official approval, and so he undertook the process. And, uh, it, and you can still hear some of the, I think, some of the, the radio shows and stuff that Sheehan did at the time where he talked about this whole process, how surprised he was and how surprised Father Davis was that not even they – would be allowed to put their eyes on the secret information that the Vatican had on the alien uh, agenda on Earth now, not just someday maybe, on Earth now uh, uh, in at that part of the Vatican Library. And so they were so surprised, they actually sent uh, the, the request the second time, and they sent it directly to the Jesuit, who was the head of the Vatican Library, and explained to him that in case he didn't get it the first time, this was an official request from the Jesuit headquarters in Washington, D.C. It was an official request from the Congressional Research Service of the Library of Congress. It was, a, it was a personal request from the President of the United States and the United States Congress who wanted to purview that information. And they, they were certain, right, that under some set of circumstances, those files would be made available and they were flatly turned down by the Vatican they they were told absolutely not nobody is going to get to look at this information well by the way if you don't have information you don't turn down letting somebody like that look at it you just simply tell them it doesn't exist it's a figment of your imagination that's not what they were told they were told it exists you're not seeing it ever so there's a lot of evidence uh, to support what Balducci was claiming, and that was that the Vatican was using its amazing resources around the world to gather intelligence information uh, on what was going on on Earth right now. Um, by the way, you mentioned a little uh, earlier, Steve, you mentioned uh, Alaska. Uh, at some point during this show, I want to I give you an update on an investigation that you and I did some years ago that happened to kind of turn around and come back into the picture a little more recently. Well, I think I think it's I think this is going the way it's supposed to go, and I, I want to share something, Tom, that's critical. You put it up on your website, I put it up on my website. Uh, the story, the conehead skulls being found in Mexico, and the right. claim that it was done by parents. Let me tell you something. I've had guys who are some of the best anatomical sculptors in the world and forensic guys, and when they rebuild that conehead skull that was shown in the article for Mexico, there is no way that's head binding. In Montana, we have the Flathead Indians. You can deform a skull, but you cannot change the eye sockets, the jaw sockets, nor the cranial mass. In other words, you can change the shape of something, but it's fascinating because these go back directly into the time period that David Flynn used to write about in the Manet and Manetto's Table of Kings prior to the creation of uh, Adam and Eve and the 
lizard-like. If you've ever seen the pictures of Quetzalcoatl and yeah. all of the, and, and you touch on this too, the alien serpent race, this is identical to the face reconstructed of Quet the only known artist's conceptions from the 1500s described to those guys who could, you know, sketch and stuff, but that in no way is that head binding, and that's probably the most in-your-face uh, present excavation of aliens in the bottom line in Mexico, and when you look at all of the great pyramids and not what went on on them, the, the whole bottom line in the Aztec, Incan, and uh, Mayan culture is they were started by aliens, they were built by aliens, and all the blood sacrifice was just basically a day at the uh, lunch counter for the aliens that basically were able to stay out or stay in control through the technology they had. The reason that's critical is because that same thing now is turning up. I'll be sending you, uh, Thomas, so I can get it in a form I can send it. I just got it recently. Actual petroglyphs that people have not seen from the desert southwest that are so amazingly clear in showing that they're aliens. There's nothing human about them, not just the size, but the shape of the head is identical, and these things supposedly go back two to 4,000 years. Well, you know, here's the thing. Um, we all are familiar probably with the Smithsonian giant cover-up. Um, the, 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 we live in a period of time now where more and more it's becoming impossible for the powers that be to do what the Smithsonian did, we have people that go out and they dig into these burial mounds and get those giants that the Indians had talked about, and they get the bones and they take them into the Smithsonian and they hide them, or any other uh, uh, organization that is seeking to try to control man's idea about Earth and Earth history and the date of the Earth and, and to try to make the world believe that the idea of the giants is something more than mythology. Um, but now with, you know, with uh, Google Earth and, and satellites that armchair astronomers can set there. In fact, there was a, there's an article today, I don't even remember the headline, but it's over on Raiders News Update, where something like 42 new alien worlds were just discovered by armchair astronomers. So more and more it's getting impossible for the um, powers to, that be to control uh, the flow of this information and the discovery of this information. And um, you, we know this, first of all, that they existed. There would be evidence of them that they existed. We also are increasingly of the persuasion that they exist on Earth now. I'm talking about living and breathing. Yes. And furthermore, we know if you believe the Bible, if you're, a, if you're a biblical literalist like I am, we know that the Bible predicted that at the end times this would be one of the signs of the times, the return on earth of the Nephilim. Um, the ancient Hebrews that translated the Septuagint into Greek understood that the prophet Isaiah, in chapters 13 and 14 of Isaiah, that he was predicting the return of the giants with monsters at the advent of the destruction of Babylon, which is something to still happen in the final age. And you and I have quoted and talked about that verse before, Isaiah 13, the, uh, open the gate, ye ruler, I give command, and I bring them, giants are coming to fulfill my wrath. The 16th chapter of the book of Enoch writes of the deceased offspring of the watchers, the spirit of the giants, the Nephilim, as being released at the end of time to bring slaughter and destruction upon man. Um, uh, this comes to pass as part of God's day of uh, the Lord or his great tribulation when Satan and his angels punish the unbelieving world before they are resigned to the pit. And that particular prophecy mirrors Isaiah. It mirrors the, apoc the apocryphal works that indicate there would be a future date in which watchers will rise for judgment, but the spirits of their giant offspring ahead of that are going to be remanifested upon earth to wreak havoc upon the earth. Uh, the Book of Jubilees, an ancient Jewish religious work, talks about this. Uh, what what other texts? Um, uh, well, Esdras, you know, you quoted uh, quite a few times, and a lot of what you've written is that your women will give birth to monsters. That's actually a verse that you turned me on to some years ago. Well, we both got it, and I forget who, but I mean, here's the thing that you're saying in a nutshell, and, and ladies and gentlemen, it is kind of funny, and you're seeing it in real time, the parallels 
could this could not be orchestrated by anyone less than the Holy Spirit. Just as the evil presence in the earth, there God is being faithful, raising up men and women, giving them the understanding that was sealed in Daniel's day, but it's being opened. And the thing that even uh, Sir Isaac Newton talked about, and Dave Flynn was the first fruits of having uh, stood upon the shoulder of a giants, the first to crack Newton's coal, a code, excuse me, and then he went home to be with the Lord, and now there are others who are, who are being given insights, and it's for this, it's because Jesus loves his children, he loves his people, he loves his creation, and there is a war of intergalactic proportion. Tom, I was told two years ago, just to put this into context, and we've talked, so I think you know what I'm referring to in, 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 in part, is that there was an attempt to break through literally the uh, things that we have in deep, deep space uh, by uh, an armada, and it was the advance uh, scouting party, and they were stopped. And interesting, I was told that, I was told maybe intentionally, I think it must have been intentionally now, and I broadcast it on, uh, on the radio, and some of you will remember the broadcast, it, it, it wasn't a fake war of the worlds, it was a real-time war of the worlds, where I said a certain group of the MMB, Mighty Men and Valor, and, and had been told to stand down. Well, those guys who control the entities that are coming, or at least in communication, took that as mean they had a fair uh, rule and run at the planet. So God is still stopping them, and because of that statement, I guess the, a trap was laid. And uh, again, people have a hard time wrapping their brains around this stuff. And I understand, you know, there, there's, there, it, it is so out of bounds of what we've been told. But in the world that they live in, what they talk of is the core C-O-R-E reality. And what we live in is the illusory world of lies, bloody lies, and extreme lies. I won't use the other word, but that's where we live. And, but the thing that you've been saying and I've been saying the longest is that we are now at the time where this is going. It's going by the book. It's going in, in a very uh, progressive and an accelerated rate. And when you've got, how many Catholics are there? And this isn't Catholic bashing. There are, what, a billion and a half people that are Catholics. And I don't think they understand the battle that they're going to be in, the traditional Catholics versus those who are going to uh, be tried to be swayed to accept the alien God. And I think that the time has come where, you know, people, I don't care what, uh, where they claim they've come from, they, when they say that whatever uh, tradition or, or religious background, they've got to get it right with Jesus because the deception is going to be so great. I'm getting emails. Is this a great deception Jesus talked about? Hello? Yes, it is. <laughs> well, and while the Vatican is certainly going to be the biggest duck in the puddle with uh, upcoming responsibility, for controlling the flow of disclosure information for the world's religious communities. They're certainly not alone among uh, consulting academia. For instance, there are astronomers who are working to pinpoint the alien home bases. This is part of what's a, a real mystery to us right now. And they're searching for what they call Dyson spheres. They're searching for large artificial uh, structures, but some of these are being funded. In fact, the, 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 some of the most newsworthy ones that are searching for Dyson Spheres, they're being funded in large part by the Templeton Foundation, who you and I have talked about before, a philanthropic organization that's interested in genetics, and they're interested in, in very alien-sounding transhumanist aspirations as the path towards hybridizing humanity to post-human. Um, the, the, the Templeton Foundation, I, I think we talked about this. I'm not going to get into it. They're the ones that have been funding this series of lectures over at the Arizona State University. We're back to Arizona again, right? Facing the Challenges of Transhumanism, Religion, Science, and Technology. That's the name of the series. But that led to, um, in 2009, that led to a second uh, project at ASU called the SOFIA Project, um, named after the Greek goddess Sophia, because Sophia is the one that helps us make contact with them. Uh, and the express purpose of the Sophia Project, according to the ASU website, is to verify communication with and to contact other worldly entities, extraterrestrials, or universal intelligence and God. That's right off their website. Now, there's another university that we suspect could be involved in the cover-up of the... Of uh, now, I'm use when I say alien, you can just insert the word demon or demonic. But to use their language, 
the cover-up of the alien presence, artifacts, and or mysterious technology. And this, this um, university is Penn State, or at least one of its well-known lecturers. And this is the story, Steve, that goes back to 2005. So how long ago is that? Eight years ago. You and I were doing a series of Q-File shows. And suddenly, a story shot across the world wide web of a giant Le leviathan type creature that had been discovered in the polar ice of Franz Joseph Land. And this colossal being was described as having horns that were immense in dimension that protruded from incredible length. The body was covered with coarse fur, uh, body-like armor like, uh, like an armadillo uh, that protected its joints and heads. Well, you and I at the time started investigating the story that week. Um, including analyzing the audio files and the video files. Do you remember this? Yes, I do. Now that I, I had completely spaced it out, but now that you bring it up, I go, goodness, I forgot about that. <laughs> well, this story has new life all of a sudden. You, back then, you and I, tra you, actually, not you and I, you tracked down the helicopter pilot that had flown over and filmed the Leviathan video. And according to the pilot, Sony had created this docudrama hoax in order to virally promote the release of a new PlayStation 2 game called Shadow of the Colossus, remember? Absolutely, and I did literally talk to that pilot. Yeah, and you reported the, actually the discussion with the pilot to George Norrie on Coast to Coast AM that same week. But before the whole thing was put to rest, other evidence was being earthed, unearthed by a couple of people who were working for me at Raiders News Network that suggested maybe all of us had only scratched the surface of what was really a much deeper mystery or a bait and switch that was designed to throw people off the trail of a legitimate recovery effort at or near the Franz Joseph site. Well, among the most interesting and potentially telling pieces of that puzzle was a senior lecturer in anthropology and American studies at Penn State University by the name of P.J. Caplati. Um, just before the so-called hoax, Days before, before the hoax was perpetrated, this professor had been conducting archaeological studies of Franz Joseph Land, and then, and this is really important to note this, he followed his research of the site by immediately advocating to the United Nations the need to establish international laws and or treaties, and this is to quote him, to preserve alien artifacts, end quote. Now, here's a, here's a quote from what he wrote at that time. This was written for, um, and I can send the link to people that want to uh, go and read this for themselves. It was one of, like, archaeology today, and I still have the link in my computer. Here's what he wrote. Quote, the late biochemist and science fiction writer Isaac Asimov once speculated that the galaxy may contain 325 million planets with traces of civilizations in ruins. Perhaps our astronomers and their SETI stations are hearing only static through their radio telescopes because they are, in effect, listening for a message from the extraterrestrial equivalent of the ancient Maya, or the Sumerians, dead civilizations that can speak to us now only through archaeology. Constructing a catalog of visual signatures of advanced civilizations will someday be within the province of aerospace archaeology and with a potential cult cultural resource database of 325 million planets with civilizations in ruins, there sure is a lot of field work to do out there, end quote. That's what he wrote right on the heels of whatever he was doing in Franz Joseph land. Well, at the time, that raised a really big question in my mind whether Caplati's team had discovered something in Franz Joseph land and or a nearby expedition, uh, expedition site needing international protection, something that would correspond to artificial remains elsewhere in the galaxy, as he was referring to, that would also need international protection, something that could even be big enough to employ Sony or somebody like that to concoct a cover-up. Well, the question was, back then, was the helicopter pilot paid off or threatened against admitting the truth about what he had actually filmed. Uh, as you know, 
Steve, as extraordinary as that sounds, history has shown over and over again how governments participate in scenarios like that. I mean, you look at the ridiculous Roswell weather balloon cover-up story, and they threaten people's families. And, you know, when you're being told, here's the story, this is what you say, otherwise people you care a whole lot about could be hurt very bad. Um, you know, you just go along with the story, right? But there's, a, <clears throat> there's an intriguing aspect of this 2005 case that turned up more recently. And it's uh, like the pro-transhumanist Templeton Foundation's funding to locate Dyson spheres and other worldly enti entities and extraterrestrials in order to promote the alien hybridizing of man. Caplatte more recently seems to have come away from the very Franz Joseph Land findings with the belief that aerospace archaeology is somehow connected with the next step in human evolution. Now, there's two things I want to tell you. First of all, and it's, they removed it. They removed a Penn State personal web server entry by him, but I tracked it down to an aerospace archaeology wiki, which is still online, and this is what Capilotti wrote. I, this is what he said more recently. I prefer the term aerospace archaeology for no other reason than it includes the study of sites, which I believe will become increasingly important to the study of modern man as technological possibilities continue their course of altering the possibility of human evolution, end quote. I read that and I thought, what in the world, what type of technology could Capilotti's team have recovered in Franz Joseph land that convinced him, number one, that man's evolution is going to be altered via aerospace technology, and secondly, that international laws and treaties need to be established to preserve alien artifacts. Well, in uh, following your and my 2005 investigation, Capilotti, uh, uh wrote a book called The Human Archaeology of Space, Lunar, Planetary, and Interstellar Relics of Exploration. It was published by McFarland Publishing, in which he discusses the very same shadow of the Colossus Leviathan conspiracy that you and I investigated, and furthermore, he quotes me and you. He admits, he admits that at the time, he made two voyages to the North Pole on board the Russian icebreaker Yamal, you know, uh, yep. And here's what, he's, here's what he says. During the voyage, as we returned from the pole, we landed by helicopter on Rudolf Island in Franz Joseph Land, end quote. Caplati then describes his team's excursion to the site, get this, um, to examine the remains of an enormous spacecraft. Now, he then goes on to claim that the enormous spacecraft was a Soviet TB-3 bomber, Whose, whose presence the Soviet Union was also trying to bury as deeply as possible. In fact, if you read his book, the more you read, the more questions it raises about why in the world would the Soviet Union be so concerned with burying the fact that they had a crashed bomber uh, out there. But how, uh, why surveying a crashed airplane could be described as needing international laws and treaties to preserve alien artifacts why it would be uh, described as an enormous spacecraft, and how would it have the power to alter humanity via, via aerospace archaeology. Nothing in this sentence, uh, nothing in these paragraphs that he writes adds up. But then he actually takes several pages, not only to talk about the shadow of the Colossus Leviathan conspiracy, but he starts naming our research. Uh, he talks about uh, how, uh, it, well, here's a quote, this aerospace archaeology taken up as a central element of an argument for the presence of artifacts of extraterrestrial intelligence here on Earth in a series of articles called Stargates, Ancient Rituals, and Those Invited Through the Portal. Remember that series, Steve? Yes, um, that was one that's, that was so phenomenal and how many times it was downloaded across the world. Yeah, but it was all me and you and Q-File shows. Anyway, it was posted on, uh, I think it was, might have been posted on your side. It was posted on Raiders News Update. And he goes on to talk about how we speculated that it was uh, the disbelievers that were being conned, in this case, by a specially created hoax that was, in fact, part of a larger cosmic conspiracy involving, you guessed it, me, end quote. That's an exact quote. But after republishing this large part of our investigation in his Archaeology of Space and Interstellar Relics work, 
Kaplati then repeats his claim, nothing otherworldly was discovered at Franz Joseph Land, but he does so once again without explaining how could a crash Soviet airplane lead to the next step in human evolution, nor why, following whatever was discovered in the Arctic Ocean north of Russia, that had provoked his immediate advocacy of international treaties to preserve alien artifacts. So it's quite amazing, isn't it? Um, right, and, and let's tell people where Franz Joseph Land is. It's basically directly north of, uh, oh, let's see, it's, it's north of the Barents Sea. If you go to Scandinavia, the top of Sweden, you just go due north and due east. It, but here's something interesting. It's very close to Svalbard. I mean, that's the closest uh, area, and Svalbard is where all the globalists have their uh, seed bank. Remember that, Tom? Right, absolutely. So the question is, okay, is there something uh, in Svalbard, too? Look, here's the deal. Everybody that I know and have talked to who's in that world of ultra-black, Hawk has made mention of the Death Star, actually hearing communications or people that have, and Death Star is not like the Star Wars, but the very thing that people are mocking. You and I have done as, uh, just a, a lot of hours of trying to get people to understand this, but it's like the uh, Black uh, Sea artifact, that was sending out signals. It's like the, the crystal uh, uh, pyramid off the Bermuda Triangle. The thing that people have got to understand is the true reality versus the false reality. The core reality, stargates and everything Tom and I talk about, that's why, that's why the iPads, the iPods, the iPhones, the iMacs, and everything else that's designed to entertain us, critical thinking has been subdued by entertainment and subharmonic mind control. And so what we have right now is we have a, a breaking forth of relics, we have a breaking forth of real revelation, and, and I tell people, Tom, if they'll do their own homework, after you and I go on a show, obviously everybody will say, oh, I think those guys are crazy. Well, you can think we're crazy, but we've spent the majority of both our lives investigating this stuff in, in, in the mouth of two or 3,000 witnesses. Maybe there's something there to get your attention, my attention, our attention. And now with what you guys have found out at Mount Graham, it blew my mind and provoked me to go further. And I thank God for that because it seems like whenever uh, you, know, you do something that you're doing, it triggers me, or I'm doing something, it triggers in you, meaning it brings us into a realm that God says it's time, guys. I want you to reveal this to my people. Why? So they're not to so they're not destroyed, and so they're not uh, led away captive by uh, demons, doctrines of demons, and fallen angels. And that's about it in a nutshell to describe why most people simply are they're too tuned in to the mind control to do any critical thinking on their own. And while they do that, they've abdicated their uh, duty to be uh, uh, constantly vigilant and standing guard or standing up for the truth. I can tell you this that the Christians are going to have their whole paradigm shaken unless they seek the Lord, ask the Holy Spirit to reveal what we're talking about to them. And you know that, that we can do the best we can, but I, I really want you, if you would, if you would just uh, explain the thinking on how the transition is going to be made at first, you know, it won't be necessary to deny your faith, but at some point everything changes, and then people are going to be not only commanded, but absolutely forced to either comply or die. And that's when it becomes, let's say, this dicey beyond the theoretical. Yeah, uh, well, and just before I do that, did you, if you've been reading the series as we've published it, did you see where Guy Cosmonalgo used the example of the Nephilim to um, draw a parallel to the type of alien saviors that might come to the earth? Did you see that? He sent us... Yes. Um, he sent us a 70-page private PDF outlining the uh, Vatican's highest thinkers on this issue, including himself. And that was one of the examples that they used in there, which I found to just be absolutely astonishing. And especially when he refers to Jesus as, as someone that we might think of as a child of one of these other races, which instantly my question back was, really? I mean, you're, what are you suggesting that, that the... That the um, um, the impregnation of Mary, which is something very sacred to Catholics, uh, that this was an, an alien abduction phenomenon, right? That's exactly what it sounded like he was saying. Anyway, 
It reminded me of another investigation that you and I did a decade ago in 2003 when archaeologists discovered a magnetic anomaly in the ground where the Euphrates River once flowed, and it turned out to be, remember this, according to the archaeologists, it was the lost tomb of King Gilgamesh, the right. leader and ruler of Samaria. And share with people who, Gil, yeah, Gil, Gilgamesh was also half man and half God, and I can tell you this, that when that was found, I was in contact with a group of people that their sole goal for our government is to secure that DNA. And by the way, it was real. And uh, the whole purpose of the Iraqi invasion wasn't weapons of mass destruction. It's they really did, Tom, pilfer what Saddam Hussein had, uh, had amassed through all the excavations in Iraq, which obviously is Babylon. So it was interesting. One general told me, point blank, he told me this one-on-one, -on -one, not through anything, but he said it to me. He said, Steve, everything in the world of black ops is either to secure antiquity and keep it from coming into the light or to acquire the weaponry and the technology to integrate into our battle plan. And some well, people just simply can't take that. Well, that's right. I mean, and if somebody wants, you know, if, if, if anybody doubts, that the tomb of Gilgamesh was found or that that's a story that, uh, you know, we didn't have our facts on right, they can email me. I can send them the stories from that time. They're still online. The Assyrian International News Agency, ABC News, the BBC, I mean, these were mainstream news agencies that were covering the dis that were covering that story. We found the tomb of Gilgamesh. Of course, why is that important? Because in the Bible, this was Nimrod. And in the New Testament, this is the same a personality that is described as the Antichrist. He that was and is not and yet shall be. This is the Antichrist, the son of perdition, Apollia, Apollyon, Apollo as he was known to the Greeks, Nimrod in the Bible, Gilgamesh to uh, the uh, ancient Sumerians. But this is the same personality or Antichrist spirit that's going to rise up again uh, at, in the end time. So you got to know that in high intelligence in our governments, they're fully aware of these prophecies. And when somebody says, we have found the legendary tomb of King Gilgamesh, well, <laughs> guess what? A few seconds later, you've got, you've got uh, American troops surrounding the location. But, but now, here's another thing that at the time I didn't think about, but I thought about it since. It's interesting, isn't it, that... That's the same location. That discovery is the same location that's mentioned in the book of Revelation, chapter 9, when John describes the bottomless pit opening up. Uh, the gateway to the underworld, Revelation 9, located near the Euphrates, where ancient Babylon stood, and that's where they, they said they discovered this tomb or this opening, this Gilgamesh thing. And whatever the case was, within hours of the find, the U.S. military, they go in, they set up a barrier around the site, they remove whatever's there, they secret it away to places unknown, and the media that had all been set to cover the Gilgamesh findings suddenly find themselves without any kind of a story and, and uh, in the dark. Um, now, according to uh, Graham Hancock and Robert Bavall in their book, Message of the Sphinx, at the same time, the U.S. and Egyptian government blocked independent investigations around the Great Sphinx of Giza. Why would they have done that? You know, um, the Great Sphinx, this is where some believe there is a hall of records. I don't know if that's true or not, but some people believe, and of course it was the psychic Edgar Casey, I think, that got a lot of people excited about that, but there are some very ancient works, too, that also talk about how there might be this library containing the lost knowledge of the Egyptians on papyrus scrolls, scrolls uh, the history of the lost continent of Atlantis or whatever it is, buried there. But it just shows the pattern is consistent over and over again. Uh, all this follows a very consistent protocol. In fact, in research for Exo Vaticana, uh, we tracked down a forgotten report by the Brookings Institution, the number one policy think tank in the world that have contributors from every field of science, industry, philosophy, and religion. And they published a secret report in the 1960s. We're going to give this report away free uh, when the book comes out. Uh, but they, they published this report for the Committee of Long-Range Studies of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration in which they argued in favor of NASA 
and other national agencies doing exactly what Kaplati and all these other people have argued for, and that is withholding from the public knowledge or evidence of alien artifacts. And in the Brookings uh, Institute, they speculate the reason for withholding it is because, well, they felt that it was going to completely upset the balance of uh, society if it wasn't introduced in the right way and at the right times. And what's also very interesting is that they were particularly concerned with fundamentalist Christians. In fact, I think they had Steve Quayle in mind because when you read their, their secret report, they talk about how fundamentalist Christians might react to and even define the issue through broadcast and print media. And they were very concerned about that. And as such, they said that these institutions ought to be infiltrated and gradually steered toward a particular mindset, which the government then could favor uh, in terms of deciding when disclosure would be made. So Evidently, uh, this is working with some of the Vatican astronomers, and I don't think it's working at all with Steve Quayle. <laughs> <laughs> well, i got to tell you something. I, I thought it was interesting when uh, in their long list of uh, crimes for the common man, even believing in pre-Adam, showed up on somebody's list of uh, terrorist activities. Don't you find that interesting? That's very interesting, yeah. Sure. Yeah, very interesting. You know, here's the thing. The truth will always be persecuted by the lying devils that seem to inhabit academia, the government, politics. But even the Pentagon refers to the gods of the Samaritans. And I've said on open broadcast, Tom, the last 10 years, you guys may, uh, you know, wait with bated breath for the gods of the Samaritans, little g. But when you deal with the god of heaven, and the God of heaven who is literally the Lord of hosts and the general of the hosts of heaven, I think they've got a battle in mind that they're not prepared to win, yet they will try. My general friend told me this. He said, Steve, he said, all our weapons, technology, ancient and, and contemporary, a composite of ancient combined with what we know now, is all designed for one purpose, and that is Satan and his minions and his willing dupes and the Illuminati and the industrials all believe literally, Tom, that they can make war on God. And that's what Armageddon or uh, Armageddo is, the Battle of Armageddon. It's not just, you know, everybody who's got an attitude problems, uh, problem about uh, failing currency. That's literally when the kings of the earth, in total rebellion against the king of glory, they go one-to-one -one and God says, take your best shot. And in one day, the day of the Lord's wrath, they don't stand. But until that time, the people of God have got to wake up and have got to realize that the deception will be so great that unless they are actively and with all their hearts seeking God, his, his direction, his guidance, his discernment, there is so little lack of discernment or there is so little discernment in that which professes to call itself the church that, I mean, they can dance, the, they could put the devil in a tutu and everybody would think that, oh, this is some new uh, rock star and coming on the scene and everybody would worship him. I'm not kidding. I know that's a little bit... Silly, but look, we're seeing stuff even more brazen now. We have all of Hollywood, pretty much, who, who are of the uh, idea that, you know, if they want to be fame and rich and have all the good times they can have, then they've got to sell their soul to the devil. You can go on YouTube and see probably ten of the most famous, richest rock stars in the world openly talking about worshiping Lucifer, worshiping Satan. Lady Gaga openly exposes herself, and I don't mean that just in the, the poor choice of wardrobe, but she just openly exposes herself to some of the darkest, most profane manifestations of psychic and occultic power that's ever been seen in rock and roll. And the world goes after her and gives her whole adoration. And she's talking about, you know, basically uh, doing things with dead bodies and everything else. I don't want to go there. But this right. is the appetite. These are the doctrines of demons. This is the deception. This is the great deception. And unless people understand that it is the invisible realm. By the way, everything under Giza, the Giza Plateau, it's not what's above the ground. It's what's underground. I actually talked to the man that, and a military guy who oversaw the giant sarcophaguses that were starting to flow, float out when the, one of the chambers ruptured due to an earthquake or something. Something flooded uh, the Hall of Giants. You talk about the Hall of Records. 
And he said, Steve, imagine yourself going in to giant sarcophaguses that are 18 and 24 feet tall. I get a, a, an email from a guy in India who's a fighter pilot in the Indian Air Force, and he shows me the tomb of somebody in India that's 24 feet long. Well, you know, no, people just can't imagine. They, you know, some people that, quote, supposedly go on coast to coast and are Christians, they claim that, well, Goliath was only seven feet tall. Good luck. The bottom line is a weaver's beam was taller than six feet. And the thing that's interesting to me is that all the records, Og was 18 feet, but the Native American legends, let me just give a little tidbit that's blowing my mind. They are literally, I, I've never seen, and I'm going to be you know, publishing it soon, so many uh, eyewitness accounts, multi-tribal accounts, multi-geographic position accounts of, of entities that are 60 and 40, 60, 80 feet tall. And, you know, it's amazing because we have the legend of Paul Bunyan, and that's nothing compared to what the Native Americans know. And so uh, I think it's fascinating that you, you're, we're, talking about, we're talking about the end of the galaxy. We're talking about uh, exoplanets. We're talking about exobiotic entities. We're talking about all this stuff. And yet we are, are surrounded by signs. We're surrounded by evidence. We're surrounded even by uh, rock formations, geoglyphs, petroglyphs, and everything, and all telling the same story. And by the way, the Native Americans understood how to work the stargates. Remember the little uh, Coco Pelli, and I may not be pronouncing the, his name right, but the little figure, kind of the desert dancer, some people call him a devil dancer with a little flute. Right. That right. flute is what controls the gates. I don't know the pitch. I don't know what it takes. But that syncs and links up what I've been told by the people who basically control the stuff that goes bump in the night. So, interesting. Yeah, um, if I can interject a question here um, to either Steve or Tom, I, I've got a, a – this is interesting on a couple of levels, and, and, and this goes back to what you said earlier. Uh, this is from Dwayne, who's listening actually uh, live. We're being simulcast out of a station of the Pacific Northwest, KWAX. Um, uh, either one. Um, to put this in perspective, uh, are you gentlemen saying that uh, uh, there are aliens um, on, on Earth today that could be connected to the Illuminati or part of the Illuminati, if not in practicality or in theory, but in practicality, that believe that they're the offspring of alien life and they're waiting on a return uh, of uh, of their ancestors? Or no, I'm not sure if that uh, I truncated that question. I'm not sure if that makes sense. But I, I guess the bottom line with this question is. Are there are there people in power, in in across the world, the Illuminati, the Illuminists, who believe that they are in fact descendants of the alien life forms to which you which you refer to? So when when the aliens come back or when this alien presence makes itself known, they're going to reclaim their their power. They're going to say, well, we're part of this part of the bloodline of Jesus, we're part of the, the, the Messiah and you should worship us type thing. Is, is that Does that make sense to you? I mean, or, or did I lose you guys? Well, no, well, I, I don't. Do you? Yeah, yeah go ahead. You want to answer it, Tom? I mean, I'll answer it after you answer it or, you know, either well, one of us. I, I thought I heard us going into a commercial that was why I hesitated. Look, there are, um, like, if you read Nick Redfern's book, um, the... I, the final event or whatever it's called, he talks about the Collins elite, and this is a group of individuals um, that uh, are ex-government um, personalities that ha have basically a Christian world view that have studied the UFO phenomenon, and they believe that it is uh, demonic in nature and that it is leading towards deception. Uh, in fact, we're going. I'm supposed to get a sit down with a member of the Collins elite, and we're going to be talking about that too in our research, but. Uh, I asked Nick Pope, the former director for the Military of Defense uh, out of Britain, uh, who ran their uh, UFO investigation department for many years, I asked him if he was familiar with the Collins elite that Nick uh, Redfern talks about and whether uh, there was anything in the United Kingdom like that. And, and I'm going to publish what he told me in the book. It's too much for me to cite right here, right now. Um, but he assured me that there is among the aristocracy in Britain certainly members who um, 
uh, are occultists, and they very much believe that they are descendants from a reptilian race. Now that sounds just unbelievable, right? We, we, we think we're talking here now about David Icke or something, but there are people, they do believe this, they do believe they are of particular bloodlines, and they are very much committed to an occultic worldview regarding um, UFOs and aliens. And I'm going to tell you something else, and I've never said this on radio before. One of the biggest secrets in the upcoming book, Exo Vaticana, <clears throat> actually has to do with part of my family. It's a secret that I've kept buried my entire adult life. Uh, it's remained sealed partly due to a binding agreement and a settlement between members of my family and state and federal investigators. Part of this has to do with a family member who was a nuclear physicist with the uppermost security clearance doing research into nuclear and biological warfare at General Atomics in San Diego, California. And at one point, he was transferred from General Atomics to Los Alamos National Laboratory in northern New Mexico, where he was involved with a top secret project, the details of which at that time we were oblivious to. Of course, that's the same facility that was founded during World War II as a covert laboratory to coordinate the Manhattan Project, right? The Allied undertaking to develop the first nuclear weapons. But more sinisterly, that site's been connected to alleged secret alien underground facilities beneath the uh, Archuleta Mesa on the New Mexico border near Dulce to uh, genetic experiments on humans, to UFOs, even to uh, five alien bodies, extraterrestrial biological entities that were recovered according to the, the story in 1947 from Roswell and were purportedly sent to a safe house there at Los Alamos. In any case, it was during that time while this member of my family was conducting top secret research for the U.S. government at Los Alamos that one night after he came home, he uh, got drunk and under the influence of alcohol started talking about the laboratory where he was working, including information uh, in how it was involved with the so-called alien agenda. And he started bragging about stuff that I'm not going to discuss on this show or any other show, and I'm not going to write about it online, but it is in the, it's a whole chapter, first time ever. This has been concealed since the 1960s. And as people are going to learn, uh, what happened following his admission speak for itself because um, he disappeared, never to be heard from again. And there's a whole story around that. The story even involves government counselors and, Steve, what can only be thought of as highly placed covens within national agencies that direct so-called alien abductees according to certain protocols. Um, the most explosive of which was actually uncovered when a federal investigator worked with a member of my family uh, concerning a particular state that then connected to numerous other states, and they finally had to settle with this member of my family um, and other experiencers, as so-called alien abductees are called, in which an agreement was reached for their silence. I personally attended two of those meetings in which the investigator and the attorneys for both sides and the federal investigator were in attendance. It was held inside the state building inside that state where the agreement was reached. Um, and once people know that story, well, it's been buried since the 60s. They're going to understand why it's been kept under wraps until now. It had to be. And also why uh, I've had an interest in understanding the so-called alien abduction and hybridization scheme. But the bottom line is there is definitely a very, very powerful and organized occult aspect to the whole so-called alien abduction phenomenon in which you have people who are members of government in high-profile positions, and they definitely believe that they are dealing with uh, an intelligence from a hyperdimensional reality, but that I would call and Steve would call and others of our persuasion would call demonic and deceptive entities that are leading these people down a path towards destruction. Um, so 
That's all I can say about that. I'm not going to talk about it online, and I'm not going to write about it online, but I, for the first time since the 1960s, I have written a chapter about it, and it will be in the Exo Vaticana book, and it's going to be, I think, absolutely shocking um, to a lot of people. That's amazing, and folks, let that sink in for a while. Holy cow. Yeah, okay. Well, I'll tell you, Mr. Horn, uh, thank you for sharing that, by the way, that, that last uh, that last part. I know it's uh, quite personal, but uh, my goodness, I, I just can't. Uh, now, now, your book is going to be coming out in April, you said. Is that correct? Well, we're hoping so. I mean, we've set the target date for April 15th, but we still are right in the middle of this investigation. That's why I said the radio show was a little bit premature. There's some things I wished I could talk about right now. But unless we can nail them down, you know, we just don't want to go out on a limb and say things and then later find out maybe our sources weren't exactly uh, accurate. Just like last time, right. we hired a private investigator. We track things down. We make sure that the information is correct. And we go out on a limb and try to get interviews with, the, you know, the very people who are involved. Frankly, we were surprised uh, that we got uh, numerous uh, exchanges with Father Guy Cosmonogo. Um, but you don't know if you will unless you ask, right? So we did. <laughs> and uh, boy, I mean, we, <laughs> we, were, we were shocked at some of the information that we got. And uh, we'll be talking about that. In fact, um, when the book comes out, we're going to do the same thing we did with Petrus Romanus in that we're going to make, and this time there's so much information, we're going to have to put it on two data DVDs. Um, but there will literally be um, tens of thousands of pages of documents, books. Uh, for instance, um, Steve, we, um, uh, Chris did in his investigation, he found a book by uh, Father Malachi Martin that we didn't even know existed. It was only published in French. Uh, and it's 300 pages. And in it, he named certain popes who are or were Freemasons. And it even talks about how the secretary... Uh, the uh, state there for the Vatican had uh, documentation, images, pictures, video of them in their rituals, in their rites. Well, we're going to talk about some of that stuff, but we're going to make all of this information available for free uh, when the book comes out. Uh, and um, so, anyway, hopefully April 15th, uh, that's when it'll be happening. Beautiful. Beautiful. Steve, are you back with us? Steve, are you there? All right. Well, uh, Joe, uh, he's uh, he's connected. Oh, all right. Just be away from his mic. I don't know if he muted or, or it. muted or mute. It says yeah. he's on. So okay. Uh, well, Mr. Horn, where do we go from here? Because we've covered a lot of ground, or you've covered a lot of ground here in the last two hours. For for the person listening, a lot like me, I'm I'm wondering. Okay, no, no. no yeah. What what are we to be looking for here? You've, you've got the uh, you've got the Vatican having an observatory in uh, here, and and uh, and by the way, that Lucifer uh, device. I, I mean, isn't that kind of like an in your face thing uh, to to name it? I, I know it's an acronym, but uh, my goodness, what would an in your face type of thing to, uh, to 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 name that? But 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 that said. To the average person listening to this broadcast, how will everything that you affect, that, that, that you said, how will that affect the average person like me, like a Christian, God-fearing Christian who wants to adhere to the Bible in the literal sense, wants to be obedient to God? What are we talking here in terms of the possibility of getting knocked off the rails? Well, first of all, I think knowledge is power. I don't think there's any need for anybody to be knocked off the rails. I think it's very important for people um, to be devoted first to Christ and their family and second to their doctrine. A lot of people, um, I was a pastor for 25 years, and I had to be willing to say at some point along the line that some of the stuff that I was indoctrinated with in college wasn't correct. For instance... I was indoctrinated in what's called the Sethite view, that the sons of God in the Old Testament were not angels that came down and took women and created giants, but rather that we were just talking about the, the sons of Seth, 
um, marrying themselves to righteous women, uh, which of course doesn't explain anything about about how giants <laughs> were generated out of that marriage. But that was how I was formally educated, and I still remember the day when a lay person came up to me, and they said, "Yeah, but uh, have you ever thought?" about this theory and that was and it was the first time that I'd actually heard a cohesive explanation that what had actually happened was what's you know now called the angel theory that angels came down in the days of Jared upon Mount Hermon came down in the valley of the plains took wives of all which they would and out of that were born these mutated life forms the giants and I thought that was the stupidest thing that I had ever heard in my life right but but the bottom line was, by nature and also by training from my father, who was both a military and a police guy, um, an investigator, I you know I was willing to think about whether I was wrong, and maybe my training, my formal training, was wrong, my indoctrination was wrong, and over a long period of time, I would have never thought that now here today, you know, I'm probably one of the leading personalities out there championing the angel view, but for me. It only happened as a result of being honest and following the uh, information uh, to where it logically took me. And that, of course, illustrated that all of the ancient uh, texts, all of the early church fathers, all of them subscribed to what's now called the angel view. And it was only for political reasons that the church was trying to save face that in the third century, somebody invented what was called the Sethite view. So a uh, bottom line is what I'm saying is, People who are honest and who can listen to what we are talking about um, will judge for themselves whether there is anything substantive about it. And I think they're going to have a very difficult time if they read the report in April, hopefully by the 15th, Exo Vaticana, the final report with all the documents and all of the hours of interviews with all these various world experts, uh, people who some are even still in the uh, government, I think they're going to have a very difficult time um, uh, dismissing that there is something unusual going on, and part of it is at Mount Graham with that. When we went to that, by the way, we went with questions, and we didn't go with preconceived answers. We went with questions concerning high-level Vatican astronomers and what they had been discussing with media in recent years. Comments like Jesuit priest Guy Cosmonalgo, who later gave us an interview, a leading astronomer. He turns up in media as a spokesman for the Vatican all the time. He works at NASA. He's taught at Harvard and, and MIT. He currently splits his time between the Vatican Observatory and Laboratory, the Spicola Vaticana, which is the headquarters, the summer resident of the Pope, in Castel uh, Gandolfo, Italy, where he's over the Pope's um, astro, uh, you know, asteroid collection. He splits his time between there and Mount Graham in Arizona. And over the last few years, he has been focusing so much time and effort in an attempt to reconcile science and religion in public forums, but specifically as it relates to the subject of extraterrestrial life and its potential impact on the future of faith. And so as a result of that, we contacted him. He agreed to be interviewed via the Internet from Rome. I will tell you that once he knew uh, what we wanted to examine, that uh, after giving us a whole lot of information, he then started keeping really short, <laughs> if not altogether evasive, <laughs> his answers. But on the upside, he was gracious enough to send us a copy of a private PDF, and it's a gold mine of what he and the Vatican are considering regarding the ramifications of astrobiology, specifically the um, disclosure of advanced extraterrestrial life. We are, by the way, also going to make that PDF available for free. But in, oh, it, wow. he, but in it, he talks about how societies are going to look to the alien soon to be the saviors, saviors of humankind. And then to illustrate that the theological soundness of that possibility, he argues what I was talking to Steve about a moment ago, that humans uh, are not the only intelligent beings that God's created. Non-human life forms, he says, are described in the Bible. And then to illustrate the kind of aliens that we're going to be in contact with, uh, he references the Nephilim. And um, uh, I, we will provide all of his quotes, everything that he said. Uh, but you have to ask yourself, I mean, if... 
just really where are these people coming from, especially when they start talking about Jesus being the potential child of another race, which is alien abduction by any other uh, by any other way of thinking about it. Um, the bottom line is there are Vatican scholars, not all of them, but the ones we talk to that are dealing with astrobiology that believe that Jesus may have been the star child of an alien race, um, that the virgin birth in reality might have been an alien abduction. Now, they might not use that language, but all you have to do is read what they're saying. That's exactly what they're saying. She was impregnated by E.T. She gave birth to a hybrid Jesus. Um, the star base, as the local Indians call it on Mount Graham, includes a Dr. Christopher Corbali, the vice director for the Vatican Observatory Research Group on Mount Graham, uh, up through this up through this last year, up through 2012. He says that our image of God is going to have to change when disclosure of alien life is made and confirmed by scientists, including the need to evolve from the concept of an anthropocentric God into a broader entity, meaning the Earth is not special, humans are not special, there's intelligent life all over the universe, some of them morally superior to us, and God is the broad entity that created all of them, and they're going to come here. They are going to teach us a better way. Vatican Observatory Director Father Jose Funes, he's also been in the news. You can, you can Google this stuff where he's talking about our brother, but he says that they are going to confirm the true faith of Christianity and the dominion of Rome. In fact, when the, when the El Observatory Romano, which is a Vatican-owned newspaper, doesn't publish anything that the Vatican doesn't prove, when they asked him what he meant by that, he said, how can we rule out that life has developed elsewhere? And just as we consider earthly creatures as brothers and sisters, we would consider them as extraterrestrial brothers. We're part of, they're part of creation. And believing in the existence of such is not a uh, contradiction to Catholic doctrine. In other words, definitely going to be a contradiction to guys like Tom Horn and Steve Quayle, <laughs> <laughs> probably Doug and Joe Hagman, yeah, but like not the Catholic doctrine. So they really are positioning themselves to be the answer source for the world's religious communities when official disclosure is made. Now, they're either putting themselves in that position because they know something we don't know, or they're putting themselves in that position because they suspect something that we don't know. Well, what well may I answer? Yeah, hey, Tom, of course they, they not only know, they have, they have their own, how do I say this, and this is coming from the guys, the two of them are dead now, but, you know, for what it's worth, the equivalent of uh, uh, your former guy used to talk to, okay? But they said the Vatican has their own, and it's not just the Vatican. Let's make this clear. The Protestants, some of the people you see in the highest non-Catholic positions in the world are, uh, I'm just saying this, you need rowdy, rowdy, rowdy piper glasses to see. And if you guys finally figure it out that the Democrats and the, the Republicans and all of those entities that you're seeing uh, basically trying to take your ability to defend yourself against what's coming. Look at it this way. A good, uh, a good uh, uh, a position to take is you don't surrender your guns, or guess what? It's not a question of hunting. It's you becoming the hunted. And I'm, I'm, I couldn't be more serious, but the point that people have got to understand is this, is that it's everyone's responsibility to take what they're hearing tonight from Tom Horn, Steve Quayle, and you take it to the Lord in prayer. If you don't know Jesus, you should ask him to reveal himself to you, because in this battle that's going on in the unseen world, and whether it's with infrared or ultraviolet, by the way, there are certain alien entities that can only be seen in a UV light versus infrared. There are different uh, ends of the spectrum. The point being is, is that we are now involved in a battle where it used to be theoretical, basically people could say it's spiritual, theological. Right now it's in everyone's space. It's in everyone's front yard. And it's soon going to be the, the things of men's nightmares will be common as the daily events and the daily headlines. So please, ladies and gentlemen, I want to share something, Doug, real quick. When I wrote the book Aliens and Fallen Angels, The Sexual Corruption of the Human Race, I think the title was so uh, uh, fit. And, Tom, I think you even when we first met each other a decade and a half ago or whatever, you even remarked on that, you know, the fact that you would use that puts such a defined aliens and fallen angels, the sexual corruption of the human race. Now you see, even in the whole realm 
of, and I won't go into the details, but in the realm of sexual enhancement, you get into the realm of perpetual arousal, you get into the realm, all this stuff has been before. And you even mentioned it, Tom, I mean, we're talking about potions, we're talking about all the occult and psychic practices, but isn't it amazing that still, the angels that were in the glory of God knew the mysteries of the universe. Even they, the ones that chose to follow Lucifer and his rebellion, it was the, the, it was the, if you will, it was the draw of that which God had given to men to procreate that they inserted themselves in to the human species. Now the question is, is that, and they did it as you know in the book of Giants. By the way, ladies and gentlemen, my book, Aliens and Fallen Angels, is probably won more people to the Lord, even the scientific, atheistic, and agnostic realm than anything I've ever written. And please, you can order it online and also Angel Wars. What I've tried to do, Tom, is give both the beginning and the end. And, and, and by the grace of God, you guys are filling in so many of the marvelous details but I think it's critical that people understand. When you wrote the Armand Gate, you wrote it as fiction, and I'd say this, uh, you know, you'd be hard-pressed outside of the characters to see much fiction in any longer, or Long Walkers. The only thing that was wrong in Long Walkers is I don't know how to uh, control the gates. I know they operate with sound, specific frequencies, and in some cases, words. And by the way, uh, the, the, what is it, 1001 Arabian Nights? Uh, they talk about open sesame. Well, it wasn't just a cave of treasures they were opening. It was a stargate. Most people don't even understand that stuff. So what I'm saying simply is this. Ladies and gentlemen, you need to get the data and information that Tom has written about, that I've written about, because the point is, is that there comes a time when it's no longer uh, uh, at the door. It's in your living room. No pun intended, and God rebuke every foul and unclean spirit, but there comes a time where you're going to have to know what it is you're fighting, how to fight it, and you're going to have to have the peace of God that surpasses that all understanding that in the first chapter of Luke, and this is the promise I'm claiming for myself, Tom, that we might serve God all the days of our life without fear. Because sure enough, the spirit of fear is loose in the land, and if things that you can't see bother you, wait until you see the nightmare stuff where you don't need uh, they live sunglasses to see it because it will be in your face. You know, what's interesting is <laughs> there's actually a chapter uh, in Exo Vaticana that's going to start out with Rodney Piper and They Live. <laughs> and it, But it's actually asking the question, Steve. You mentioned the angels, the, the fact that even the angels were tempted. Uh, I think the post that was put up over on Raiders today, the Exo Vaticana uh, part, whatever it is, part four, uh, raising the fact that some of the ancient texts say that these women were given potions to actually lure men and angels to their bed, sex potions, lust potions. Um, uh, and, but it was for the purpose, of course, not just of having crazy angelic sex, it was for the purpose of propagating a kind of great deception and mingling humans with alien uh, genetics. And this raises such extraordinary questions. I, uh, a moment ago, when I think you might have still been offline, I was talking to Doug and Joe, uh, about how I, back when I was a, a young preacher, you know, who knew everything on earth and had my, <laughs> had my big, you know, my prophecy uh, uh, dispensational map on the wall that would tell me exactly when everything was going to happen, exactly when it was going to happen. <laughs> uh, I thought that, I thought the whole idea of angels marrying the women, I thought it was the craziest thing I ever heard. Uh, but just being honest, studying the actual literature, and over time I came to realize it's the only thing that actually really explains. In fact, I'm at the point now kind of like Chuck Missler is. And by the way, Chuck Missler is going to write the introduction for Exo Vaticana. But I'm at the point where, where he says, uh, unless you understand the angel marrying human phenomenon, you cannot even understand the Old Testament. Until you get to the point where you understand what happened in that one single scenario, uh, you cannot understand most of the Old Testament. You definitely can't understand the uh, war between genetics, the seed of the woman, the seed of the man. You can't understand what's even being talked about. And I came to conclude that that's correct. But the, the question that's going to be asked in probably the next uh, entry, it ought to be put up probably Tuesday or something on Raiders News Update, the very next question is going to be not just 
was there an early vanguard? Did it happen once before? But is it happening right now? Are there on Earth humans that are only part human genetics and they're part something else? Now, yes. this, is a, this is a question that raises a significantly distressful question. Uh, and that is whether there are human-like creations on Earth that do not have a redeemable soul in the Judeo-Christian sense. That is, the soul of a human as different than the nature of any animal in that man alone was made in God's image and in the essence of the human person there it is capable of union with God now and transcendence from mortal to redeemed immortality after death it can be redeemed this is a debate uh, over a question that right now uh, probably most people on the internet may not know much about it but it is a furious debate that is going on among some scholars it extends as far back as early Christian, the early Christian fathers throughout the Middle Ages, especially during the Inquisition by the Roman Catholic Church, the question of whether there were human-like beings. In other words, they live. Rod, Rod, Roddy Piper puts on his glasses and finds out they're actually something else, though they look just like humans. And it's the subject of whether hybrid humans can be redeemed. This is a question that resurfaced not long ago. By the way, I was having lunch um, with the state superintendent of the Oregon District Assemblies of God, Cap Marks, and several other state representatives. And Cap leaned forward, and he said, Tom, he said, I just read the novel, The Armand Gate, that you and Anita wrote. It was good. But he said, one thing really bothered me. He said, that part where human genetics were combined with what the scientists in the book thought was alien DNA. And this led to the revival of Nephilim. He said, I never liked talking about that subject when I was a pastor because, he said, I hate the implications that there could be mutant humans that cannot be saved. Well, his abhorrence of the issue, of course, is shared by, I think, all people of goodwill, me too. But whether we like it or not, it doesn't change the fact that Nephilim, as described in the Old Testament and in the ancient book of Enoch, were devoid of natural, redeemable souls and spirits. Genesis 6, 9, the, uh, only Noah, and by extension his children, are found perfect in their generation. That's the Hebrew word uh, tamim, which means without blemish or healthy. They're the only ones that can be saved from the flood. The same words used in Leviticus to describe an unblemished sacrificial lamb. And of course, we know that the, the meaning certainly wasn't that Noah was morally uh, perfect, but that his genetics had not been contaminated with Nephilim descent, as apparently the rest of the world had become. And so in order to preserve mankind as he had made them, God destroys all but Noah's family in the flood. And the ancient records including those of the Bible, consistently describe the cause of the flood as happening because all flesh became corrupted, both man and beast. That's what the Bible says. Now, on yes. the question of whether the corrupted or altered humans had redeemable souls, this is a very difficult subject to talk about. But note what happened when the watchers asked the prophet, to beseech God for the salvation of their children. Enoch 13, 3 through 5. Then I went and spoke to them all together, and they were afraid, and fear and trembling seized them. And they besought me to draw up a petition for them, that they might find forgiveness, and to read their pet petition in the presence of the Lord of heaven. For from thence forward they could not speak with him, nor lift up their eyes to heaven. Uh, for shame of their sins, for which they had been condemned, end quote. Now, Enoch takes this petition to God. He informs the watchers uh, afterward and their hybrid children. He informs them of their situation, whether they can be redeemed. Here's what he says, Enoch 14, 4 through 7. I wrote out your petition, and in my vision it appeared thus that your petition will not be granted you, throughout all the days of eternity, and that judgment has been finally passed upon you, yea, your petition will not be granted you. And from henceforth you shall not ascend into heaven unto all eternity. And in bonds of the earth the decree has gone forth to bind you for all the days of the world, and that previously 
you shall have seen the destruction of your beloved sons. He's talking about the Nephilim. And you shall have no pleasure in them, but they shall fall before you by the sword, and your petition on their behalf shall not be granted, nor yet on your own, even though you weep and pray and speak all the words contained in the writing which I have written, in quote, Enoch 14, 4 through 7. So therefore, based on the book of Enoch, and reflected in the Bible, by the way, in such places as Genesis, Jude, Second Peter, redemption was not possible for any of the fallen watchers or their hybrid offspring, even though the Nephilim were part human. Now, in that sense, um, Nephilim, you know, maybe they're compared to an extraordinary primate, uh, intelligent like men and angels, maybe even possessing human genetics, but not Homo sapien, as fashioned by God in his image. There's further confirmation of their status as unredeemable. Um, and we also learn from the strange uh, narrative that there was this primeval belief that's reflected in the Old Testament concerning two types of resurrection from the dead. One that's strictly terrestrial. That is, a dead Nephilim can return from the grave to inhabit another corruptible body of flesh. But a second future resurrection in which eternal glorified bodies are only for those who sleep in Christ. And Isaiah makes it very clear that the watcher offspring, in this uh, chapter 26, 14, he refers to them as the Raphaim, that they cannot participate in the latter resurrection. In Genesis, excuse me, in chapter 26, 14, he says they are dead, they shall not live. They are deceased, that is, Raphaim. They shall not rise. Therefore, thou hast visited and destroyed them and made all their memory to perish, end quote. The word that's rendered deceased from the Hebrew there is shades or ghosts of the dead. So we see uh, echoed how the term Raphaim is used in two senses, one for human and Nephilim, spirits in the underworld, but in another sense for terrestrial giants. And we're going to, we're going to write something that's never been written before in uh, Exo Vaticana, in which we're taking the Rosh Hashanah text, ancient writings from Ugarit in northern Syria, uh, in which uh, the, the, uh, there are um, uh, Canaanite rituals for summoning the Raphaim from the underworld and how to bring them forth so that they can be manifested in bodies of flesh. Um, I think I got off track there. But well, yeah, but I think you need to know, too, that, and, Tom, this is somebody who's asking me, and I, I take, you know, we can, this isn't meant to argue, but it's just for clarification. The, the word Nepal, Nepal, the fallen ones, you know, people say, well, what's the difference between the Rephaim and the Nephilim, okay? Well, the giants, as you know, are the Giborim. I am is kind of an interesting uh, uh, suffix in Hebrew. It usually means one who is light. But the point I'm trying to make to clarify is this. The Rephaim, I think it's used eight times, and, and one of them is, shall the dead rise to praise thee? Uh, what is that in Isaiah? The thing that's interesting, though, is in, in the German, uh, archaeological circles, they always referred to the giants as the valley of the Rephaim, the bones of the Rephaim, and never that I could find where they call, and I'm not trying to argue, I'm just trying to say, because people will get confused, because in my writings, I write the Nephilim are the fallen angels, in your writing, you write that the, the Nephilim are the giants, so, you know, I, I just want to share that we may have a difference of opinion, but the Rephaim are the dead, and you know this, that God used the word bastards, you know that that is a word that God de declared that the offspring of fallen angels and earth women were called bastards. Maybe, you know, here, what you proposed, it would sure explain the politics of the uh, United States, wouldn't it, if uh, we have a... <laughs> yeah, you know, you may, be, you may have prophesied something so accurate, so clear, and so concise, and you said earlier about the Assembly of God. I can only tell you this, obviously, having grown up in the Assembly and being offered my papers, and I didn't know what that meant, but the point is, is that they really don't want to go here. And, and when I wrote uh, Genesis 6, uh, Matthew, Master builders of the human race. Uh, the thing is, is that uh, that it's hard to get people to understand that redemption. That see, this is why there's such I, I would say cheap grace and not such an appreciation for God's amazing grace. Just like the song, because we are the focus of interdimensional jealousy. 
absolute rage that we can be redeemed through the blood of Jesus through repentance and turning away. And that's something that's forbidden to some of the most powerful archons, the most powerful cherubs, i.e. Lucifer, the most powerful fallen angels, are obviously those that fell with them. And if people understood that if entities that had seen God, had ministered under his command, had beheld the glory of the Lord and could no longer even lift up their eyes, yet the Lord says to us, us, lift up your eyes for the king of glory. And the thing is, uh, David said, from whence cometh my help? I will lift up my eyes. My help cometh from the Lord. The thing is, is that this is so amazing to me that when you put into context salvation, redemption, sanctification, in other words, God loving you, God saving you, God teaching you, us being able to walk, be transformed in our inner man, and this does not have to do with any label, it just is a relationship with the living God, that the, the angels in heaven hate that so much that they, they, they're cast in their fury, fury and every demon, that we have something they can never have, and that's called redemption. And what a blessed, wonderful revelation. If God would grant to his people who call themselves by his name, how much he loves them, and how important Jesus uh, Jesus saw our value, even when all of us were sinning, and the fact that he would give himself for us to be redeemed, that image and likeness is so marvelous. Image, yes, but likeness only through redemption. I think that absolutely the devil works overtime to keep that knowledge from the people of God by having us beat ourselves up, have others beat us up, a constant war, constant strife, in the home, out of the home, everywhere. But the point that I'm just trying to make is this. The fallen angels and their offspring can never have what anybody who's listening to this program can have simply by saying, Jesus, come into my heart. Now look, I'm giving a plea for people just simply because of this. There is no context I know to talk to people in outside of that of the blood of a lamb. And we're sharing the word of our testimony. You're, you opened up about something you've never spoken before, and we've known each other a long time, and I've never heard it. But the point is, is that all things that we are sharing, all things that God has given us, the grace and knowledge and understanding it, is for one reason. He loves his creation. Surely the Lord God will do nothing except he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. And the man with the argument or the man with the false doctrine does not win his case until he ultimately becomes honest and, and searches out the scripture to see if what we're talking is true. Well, amen and hallelujah. I mean, what am I supposed to say? <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I'm just, I'm just saying that because I'm getting a bunch of emails, okay? But, and, and well, so maybe, what, uh, maybe I can, yeah, maybe I can respond to the email. But bottom line is, what I, uh, what I was talking about the Raphaim, and I, and I definitely don't want to. I don't even know how much time we have left in the show. I don't want to get bogged down in the. We got about half an hour. Of these, of but well, okay, the. Um, I, I was talking about the Canaanites beckoning through the Rosh Hashanah text, trying to bring the Raphaim up from the dead. While they did that, though, the prophet Isaiah actually described those shades uh, greeting um, the defeated king of Babylon within the infernal region. Isaiah 14.9 says, Hell, that is Shell, from beneath is moved to uh, for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead, and that... Hebrew word there dead is Raphaim. It stirreth up the Raphaim for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. It is raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations, and they shall speak and say unto thee, Art thou become weak as we art thou become like unto us. So the, the passage is actually mocking the king of Babylon as spirits of dead royalty, according to their belief system, welcome him to the underworld. Um, but this also prefigures the final fall of Babylon the Great, like you would read about in Revelation 17 and 19, and the defeat of Satan, like you'd read about in Luke 10 and 12, that you were talking about, Steve. It also even looks back on the fall of Nimrod, for that matter, at Babel in Genesis 11, uh, who was also believed to be a giant. So it's clear that the term Raphaim designated earthly giants because in Numbers 13.33, the sons of Anak are said to be descended from, literally, children of the Nephilim. And these Anakim are described as Raphaim in Deuteronomy 2. 
So the ancient, the ancient Hebrews translated the Septuagint into Greek, uh, understanding that the prophet Isaiah was using Raphaim in this uh, second sense to predict a return of these giants with monsters, like we said earlier, at the advent of the destruction of uh, Babylon. But it also describes dead Nephilim. That's the way the Amorites looked at it, and Isaiah seems to go along with that idea that dead Nephilim in the underworld are used by the title Raphaim, and under some extraordinary circumstance, they have the ability to rise back up into a temporal, um, a corruptible body. And that goes along with all of these other various prophecies we were talking about, that in the last days, like the, the 16th chapter of the book of Enoch, the dis- the deceased offspring of the watchers, the spirits of giants Nephilim, are released at the end of time to bring forth slaughter and destruction upon man. One Enoch 16 says, uh, 16 one says, for the days of the slaughter and destruction and death of the giants from the souls of whose flesh the spirits have gone forth shall destroy without incurring judgment. Thus shall they destroy until the day of the consummation, the great judgment in which the age shall be consummated over the watchers and the godless, yea, shall be wholly consumed. So there's these all these various prophecies that uh, the Old Testament prophets in the canonical scriptures seem to agree with, that tell us that the last days are going to be accompanied with a return of these giants. So I don't know if I answered the question that that, um, the person was emailing you about, um, but but my bigger question was, or my bigger statement was, based on the documentation that we are working on right now, there is a, um, there is a persuasive argument that there are genetically altered humans on Earth now. And in fact, by the way, I already know that to be a fact because of the research that we're doing for the uh, documentary on transhumanism. Um, there well, are super soldiers. Earth. Yeah, super soldiers too are 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 you know they're 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 modifying. American or soldiers, and, and the, the, what I've been told is that the DNA, every time there is a giant find or a mummy find of a giant or a sarcophagus, the DNA is preserved and they are utilizing that. And can you imagine having, uh, you know, the entities, some of the worst entities in the history of the world, uh, a new body, if you will, or container built for them, and then the spirits being loosed and coming and reanimating those things? You know, well, it, it, that's a pretty heavy thought. I got a bunch of emails lately from people uh, concerning the uh, third season of Conspiracy Theory with Jesse Ventura, the true TV program, uh, and in particular, one um, addition that looked into human-animal hybrid experiments that supposedly have gone beyond the petri dish with rumors of a real-life planet of the apes being created. That's a quote from their website. Uh, what 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 the people that are emailing me don't know is that the producers contacted me late in 2011 with a request uh, for help. They wanted to know whether scientists had secretly crossed the Rubicon with regard to human-animal genetic experiments. And um, I spent days, numerous hours, as a consultant providing documentation, expert witnesses, but I turned down repeated requests to be part of season three, episode four, called Manimal, uh, that you can go to Jesse Venturi's website and uh, read about. The, the producers actually offered on three separate occasions to fly me to set locations in the United States to meet with Jesse Ventura and the film crew. I turned them down for reasons that I will reveal later. But um, conversely, though I uh, declined their repeated invitation to be on the show, I did set them up with Professor William B. Holbert, the consulting professor for the Department of Neurology and Neurological Sciences at Stanford University Medical Center. He is a member of the U.S. President's Council on Bioethics, and he is going to be featured together with many other experts in the upcoming documentary film that we are producing 
on transhumanism. We're hoping, by the way, Steve, that that's going to be released in 2013. And um, But uh, among all the various things we gave them, we gave them DARPA budget line items, uh, suspect locations where human-animal experimentation ethics might have passed the curtain of acceptability, uh, and uh, so on. Um, and kind of lost my train of thought where I was going with that. But the bottom line is, um, uh, they, of course, they took it in a direction that um, I didn't really want to go. I gave them the Yerkes uh, Primate Research Center, and they kind of focused the whole program around that. I didn't want to talk about just the idea that there might have been a human-animal uh, chimp that had been created, and there's evidence to suggest that, in fact, um, there was. Um, but wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's a lot of evidence of it. There's, it seems like there's 400 of them trying to destroy our country. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, I wanted to talk, though, more about the bigger picture of transhumanism, um, and that was just – they started out talking about that, and I was all excited about it, and I, agree, I agreed to be part of the show. But then when they told me it was only going to be about the fact that the Yerks um, – but, you know, here's the deal. Um, uh, Splice-like creatures – Steve, you and I have talked about this before in laboratory settings um, where scientists have – created part human part animal chimeras really is no more is no longer science fiction and uh, when i told them that they wanted to know different locations where i thought that might be happening so i gave them the yerkes national primate research center at emory university um that's one of eight national primate research centers in fact the the, the movie that was the new movie you know that came out last year that was based on uh, the old um, Planet of the Apes. They they based right. that on the Yerks. Yeah, they based that on the research that's going on at Yerks. And actually, there was a a report by Dr. Gordon Gallup. They actually interviewed him on the program. I set them up with that. He's a psychologist from the University of Alabama, um, and he is the one who said that there was a human chimp hybrid that had been engendered um, uh, and born at the Yerks Primate Center. And then after he was studied for a while, he was destroyed. Um, but really, it, that's such a, it's true, but it's such a small part of what we're talking about here. I mean, you can read Emory's professors, Rabbi uh, Michael Broidy of Emory. He was in the news not long ago talking about how Jewish law, because he's a rabbi, Jewish law would support animalized humans as long as the technology produces superior people. So, I mean, we're... They know what they're doing. We know what they're doing, uh, and um, I'm, you know, I'm looking at the clock, and it's ten until the show's over. But the bottom line is, there's a significant amount of information here. I guess we'll have to someday do a different show. That the, the, the first born uh, genetically uh, uh, altered humans are teenagers now in the United States. You, go read Dr. Joseph Mercola. Uh, talking about um, uh, genetically modified humans, uh, and Mercola is respectable, and he's talking about how these uh, these uh, genetically altered uh, kids are now in their early teens, and the and the problems with the fact that they've been genetically modified, and that they are now going to uh, pass forward at the germline genetic level those uh, alterations. Um, it isn't just the research that was done, uh, and he's talking about, by the way, reproductive medicine that was being done at the uh, at the uh, St. Barnabas um, um, Science Laboratory in New Jersey. Um, these kids are now about 13 years of age, and their mitochondrial functions have all been altered. And he talks about how, you know, this is a real problem. It's like genetic, and he actually goes into genetically modified plants and all that. Uh, he's right. But he's but but that wasn't just those experiments were repeated in 2008. Uh, by the way, they were even repeated this year, 2012. The Oregon uh, this last year, Oregon Health and Science University, the OHSU, conducted research aimed at producing genetically engineered super babies. Uh, people that want to know about that, I can send them the the actual OHSU uh, website uh, information talking about that. Um, it, it, so it's happening all over the world. In fact, um, recall how uh, this year 
um, the Olympics underscored the science. Uh, uh, Chinese swimmer Yi Shi Wen, remember her? Superhuman-like performance. But that led John uh, Leonard, the director of the World Swimming Coaches Association, to describe this 16-year-old's world-setting feat as suspicious, disturbing, unbelievable. His story is still out there. It's still on the Internet. You can Google it and read it. And he said that the authorities that tested Yi Shi Wen for drug abuse should have been checking to see if there was something unusual going on in terms of genetic manipulation. And he wasn't alone. Uh, Dr. Ted Friedman, who's the chair of the genetics panel of the World Anti-Doping Agency said he wouldn't be a bit surprised if genetic enhancements are now being secretly used on humans all around the world. So uh, Aldous Huxley's dystopian Brave New World, it's slipping in under most of the public's radar right now. Human prenatal diagnosis, screening fetal genomes, designer children, those were just the first cracks a decade ago in the dam holding back incremental changes due to the human genetic reservoir this century. And experts are now finally starting to admit it. So that's really the bigger question. But is there a place in which human genetic alteration also has a connection to the alien agenda? That's the big question. The answer is yes. The answer is yes. I mean, and, and when I say that, it sounds like, well, how can you know that? I couldn't know that unless I've been told that. And if, if the people who tell stuff like that to me can give me bona fide information that I've gotten from three different sources, whether it's the scientific, the intelligence, or the military community, the answer is yes, yes, yes. But then it goes back, Tom, to your original question. Are there, if you will, hybrids, Nephilim hybrids on Earth now? Uh, yes. I mean, the whole, the whole, listen, this is what's interesting to me. The whole human genome project was never about human genomes in the first place. They conquered that a long time ago. It was to identify, if you will, the Nephilim or fallen angel genetic markers and add it and infuse it into the human race. I think that's why Jesus' words were so amazing. You, know, you can read the words of Jesus on a superficial level, but then when you start to see that the depth of the eternal God it also follows through, and here's what I'm blown away with. The idea is, is to destroy the entire human genome. You know that. You know, uh, basically, we are, we're a trash product of, of random chance, and, and, and fallen men are going to make some kind of wonderful transhuman uh, singular uh, uh, automaton that's going to function independently. But it's kind of interesting. What makes everybody think that their brains are free of garbage? The point is, I think that's what Jesus said. It's so amazing. And it's now, uh, at this point, and by the way, this time in history, we're, what, January 13, 2013? Look at that. That's an interesting date. I'm not trying to be, you know, into numbers or anything, but I'm just saying it's interesting. We're in 2013, and we're on January 13th, and usually, Tom, and I'm, not, I'm just saying this because God orchestrates. We get to be the instruments in, in his symphony, but usually that's indicative of something coming up. Yes, there's Nephilim blood. Yes, that's what the Human Genome Project, that's, that's a lie. It was to identify the Nephilim genetic markers so they can integrate it. You think DARPA doesn't have fun with us? I'm sure that more computers will listen to this and more federal agencies, not just you know the three-letter ones, but I'm saying research will be on, and they'll be asking themselves, now, how do those guys know this stuff? Are they guessing right. it or are, are they mocking us be because we're missing yeah. it? You and I know that to be a fact. We've done drill downs on who's uh, listening to our shows in the past, and we've had every agency of the United States government listening in. Listen, um, ask yourself, why did the World Economic Forum, this is the, you know, the meeting, uh, the, the WEF that has its annual meeting in Davos, Switzerland, Davos, Switzerland. Um, why is their new report, <clears throat> Global Risk 2013, they're calling on governments to prepare for two things. Number one, uh, genetically altered humans, and number two, prepare for extraterrestrial life contact. Um, I have the full report, and it's, uh, it's astonishing. Uh, now, why would they be combining genetically altered humans with the need to prepare for extraterrestrial life uh, impact? It's because they are connected. In fact, the British Academy, the Royal Academy of Engineering, and the Royal Society to produce a narrow, a narrow joint um, study in this year, 2012, they produced a study called Human Enhancement and the Future of Work. You probably saw that. 
and they documented the alarming trend aimed at augmenting humans cognitive, uh, cognitively and physically. Uh, and they warned that we're now entering into a hybrid age. But there's an example from page 26, if you haven't read it, of their work that highlights how people are going to be engineered, Steve, in the near future to have serpentine qualities. Here's just a short <laughs> excerpt. Participants discussed how these, this is a short excerpt, these kinds of techniques may in the future aid research into the extension of the range of human vision to include additional wavelengths. We're talking now about infrared technology, a la Mount Graham, the Lucifer device. Back to the quote, examples exist in animals such as snakes that can detect infrared wavelengths, which might provide a source of research for developing approaches that can be used in humans. Potential applications could be envisioned in the military, but also in other employment from night watchmen, safety inspectors, gameskeepers, including the possibility of enhanced visions at night, end quote. So this, the report goes on to assure that tomorrow's snake people not only can see in the dark, but that they are appropriately plugged into the end times grid they serve, they're going to have uh, uh, Borg-like physical digital enhancements like cybernetic implants, advanced machine interfacing technologies. This all according to the leading uh, and oldest scientific body in the world, the Royal Academy, producing their 2012 report called Human Enhancement in the Future of Work, talking about tomorrow's humans being engineered to have serpentine qualities and also being plugged in to the Borg system. So it's coming, and the world better get ready for it. The World Economic Forum is saying they better get ready for it out of Davos. The British Academy is saying it. The Royal Academy is saying it. And Tom Horn and, and, and Steve Quill are saying it. You better get ready. It is coming. Uh, and we've only barely scratched the surface of all of the documentations, audio files, and everything else that we will be providing in the April 15th uh, investigative report called Exo Vaticana. And it's, it's literally going to take people by surprise, I think. But highly documented, well-researched, it's not speculative, um, and um, I'm, I'm frankly just not sure that people are going to be ready uh, for what we're going to publish, but we're going to do it anyway, just like we always do, Steve. Well, that's what you got to do. And, you know, I've got to tell you something. When you talk about and quoted the serpentine, I will quote you the words out of Conan the Barbarian. Sounds to me like just another snake cult. And, and that sounds simplistic, but isn't it amazing that we see the skulls that were found in Mexico, and they were, quote, they were considered serpentine and almost... They actually said it looked like the head of a snake. We're seeing all of the uh, destruction of the human genome by electromagnetic uh, radiation. Uh, Mary just sent me an email, Tom. She said, do you think they could be introducing Nephilim DNA into human through vaccines? Well, they can be doing it through a uh, chemtrail, or let's just call it genetic trail spraying. I mean, they can do a lot of stuff. But here's what the, the report you quoted earlier. Genetically modified food is designed to change the human genome. We are what we right. eat. And as you get the, uh, and you know this too, as you then introduce a mutagenic uh, uh, form of electromagnetic radiation or infrasonics, you can then mutate even your uh, recombinant DNA if you want. So what we've got here is we've got basically, we've got the siren's cry to destroy the DNA, and instead of a double helix, who knows if they want a triple helix or a half a helix, but the point is is that they're, they're working overtime to destroy the last seed of Adam, and you know that was the whole point, uh, and, and you, you, you covered it wonderfully, Tom. Noah and his family were the only genetically pure stock. They certainly weren't morally pure, but God still was able to raise up a lot of people from a, just the, I mean, he took it down to eight people, didn't he, before he, you know, did the flood. So the remnant is going to be very small. Vaccines are the kiss of death. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, just on the flu that's out there, ask yourself this. How can it be so many cases in the United States so quickly and then another uh, uh, good night outbreak in, uh, uh, I think, France, 430,000 people. We are in the times that Jesus spoke about and the entire transhumanism 
It's nothing more than the devil's ultimate and total destruction of humanity and trying to make the word of God to no effect. I mean, isn't that truly the bottom line, Tom? It is. Hey, uh, I, I'm looking at my clock. I think time's up. Um, you know, take, take, the, be, take, the, take the last three minutes and close it out. Okay. Well, anyway, bottom line is uh, revealing, isn't it, that many of the technocrats that now envision the recalibrating of humanity into homo superior, how that they admit in their own works being influenced by the, the works of men like uh, Frederick Nietzsche, from whom the phrase God is dead derives, and Goethe, the author of Faust. Nietzsche, of course, was the originator of the Ubermensch, the Overman, that uh, Adolf Hitler dreamed of engineering. And the entity that he said, uh, according to Nietzsche, uh, we would eventually evolve into. So it's the ancient watchers, again, um, the transhumanist dream of giving life to Nietzsche's Ubermenschen by remanufacturing men with animals and plants and synthetic forms of life and altering our genetic makeup through uh, viruses that are injected uh, into our systems um, and foods that we are eating today. But if a person knows who they are in Christ, I still believe that there can be supernatural protection, supernatural intervention, something Amen. that can preserve our uh, makeup, even our genetic makeup, um, that it won't touch us. It's like, you know, in the plagues of Exodus, how the angel passed over. And I believe that uh, we're in that situation, and Christians, true Christians, or may have to learn again pretty soon about the supernatural intervention that can occur on our behalf when we are covered by the blood on the doorpost, the blood of Christ. Gentlemen, I want to thank both of you. Both Joe and I want to thank both of you for an excellent program. We are up against the uh, the end of the science program. Visit uh, Tom Horn's website, RaidersNewsUpdate.com, and Steve Quayle at SteveQuayle.com. Gentlemen, uh, uh, what a fantastic program, folks! If anyone uh, wants Joe and I, we're going to be wrapping. Uh, towels with ice around our heads <laughs> tonight. Uh, we, I, I'm telling you, just a fantastic program. Uh, yeah, get this out, share so it, whatever you can do. Yes. Yeah. And I want to it, say thank you to Mr. Tom Horn and also Steve Quill uh, for making this possible. It's been a blessing having both of you on our show sharing this information tonight. God bless well, you both. Hey, Doug, Doug and Joe, Steve, thanks a lot for uh, allowing me to be part of it. <laughs>